total hip replacement, total knee replacement, arthroscopic ACL surgeries and shoulder surgeries all completely free of cost. And we had an amazing academic feast in the form of the midterm symposium of the central zone of IOA in which we had delegates and dignitaries from six states comprising the central zone. And today we have the arthroplasty conclave where we have an engaging and exciting program showcasing the latest developments in the field of joint replacement where we will see two live surgeries, the first one being conducted here at Sri Narayana Hospital by Dr. Pritam Agrawal using the opulent gold knee from Merrill. Second would be webcast of robotic TKR by Dr. Neeraj Atkar from Pune. We are also very thankful to Dr. Neeraj Bijlani and Dr. Ashok Shyam, the pioneering founders of Ortho TV, the most preferred knowledge resource for orthopedic surgeons in India and all over the world, for enabling the global live webcast of today's program through their platform. Today we have amongst us Dr. Srinu Kumar Bhaskaran from Manipal Hospital Pune and Dr. Anand Gupta from Bombay Hospital Indore. Unfortunately, Dr. Abhijit Agashi could not be with us due to a medical issue. Uh, without further delay, uh, I would like to uh, invite Brigadier Dr. H.S. Agrawal sir for his talk on PG teaching on how to do a primary TKR. Good morning everybody. First of all, I am thankful to Dr. Sunil Khemka for giving me the opportunity to deliver this talk. This is this talk is meant for the postgraduates, but however, I find hardly any postgraduate here. And for the rest of us, it is a day-to-day -day affair, but however, I will do, try to do the justice to the lecture. So how to do the primary knee arthroplasty? The aim of the primary knee arthroplasty is not only to achieve painless, mobile and stable joint, but also to correct the deformity if there is any. The important thing is the trolley. Many a time you cannot rely on your technician. He cannot foresee certain problems. So therefore you have to see what instruments he is laying and all the bone cutting instruments, nibblers of all kinds, cough elevator, and the retractors, they should be there on the trolley. And your tra trolley on the top, it should have a impervious dra uh, drapes they, uh, so that the uh, water saline does not seep through and through the capillary action, your instrument gets contaminated. And if you see, we have already kept the cocktail ready. So once you start the surgery, and most of the time, these many surgeons do the surgery under the tourniquet. So therefore, every minute of the tourniquet is important and therefore everything should be ready on the trolley and you see here the uh, TVL jig, you see the femoral jig which is side is specific is already kept assembled and ready and you see the femoral components one size up one size down as per your estimate is there so the idea is to not to waste time during the surgery even if you are doing a tunicate less surgery uh, you will find that the more the tissue exposure more is the infection and the problem so therefore, whether you are doing under tourniquet or without tourniquet, the speed is important. The patient positioning, the, we do the knee replacement in a highly flexed position. That gives two advantages. One is the, it gives a more quadricep tendon uh, access and uh, when you do the operation in flexion, the bleeding is less. We all know what is the importance of skin preparation in orthopedics. So whenever the patient comes six hours before, you have to do a thorough scrubbing with the chlorhexidine scrub. And uh, the clipping of the hair should be done on the table. And we know rest of the things. So the, the idea is to have a very, the surgical field which is draped with the iodine impregnated drape. And the stocking it is there with the cling drape so that the none of the area is access, uh, 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 exposed which can give, get contaminated. The tunica should be applied as per the calf diameter and in case the patient is very obese then you should have a conical tunica and you should know ki, uh, 
up to what extent the incision would go. The pressure in the tunica is around 275 to 300 millimeters of mercury. However, we do not apply the tunica when uh, the patient has got a peripheral vascular disease, RUC, calcification of the vessels uh, in the plain X-ray. So these are the two conditions you should not apply the tunica. And the limb should be elevated and, and exsanguinated. And you should hyperflex the knee before you inflate the tunica. Otherwise, the quadriceps will get caught and then there will be a problem in the patella tracking. The, you must not forget to give the antibiotic 10 minutes before the tunica. And you, in case you are doing the operation in the without tunica, then the, you have to have the anesthetics on the board and the should give hypotensive anesthesia in season. The incision is generally 15 centimeter in length, about one third above the patella and two third below the patella. And exposure and closure is done with the knee inflection. And flexion provide more access to the proximal quadriceps tendon, as I said. And you need shorter incision. Three landmarks are there. One is the medial border of quadriceps. Then is the superior pole of patella where you mark with the marking pen. And then you go medial to the tubular tuberosity about two to three centimeter of the, and you must not forget to leave about two to three millimeter of the cuff tissue, so that when you close, you sh should have some tissue to close. Once you are done that, uh, you have to excise the hofa spider fat, and then you go, you hold, catch hold of the anterior horn of the severed medial meniscus, and dissect between the meniscus and the tibial plateau up to the posterior medial corner. And in some cases, in difficult knee, you need to resort to the quadriceps uh, in sal slip, uh, uh, slit that you that is required. And uh, after that, you have to evert the patella. For everting the patella, you have to uh, clear the gutters, and especially the lateral para patellar gutter. And you need to uh, incise this lateral uh, patellofemoral ligament. And in case, even then, if you are not able to evert, then you have to extend the incision or you have to resort to quadriceps snip. And this is, the, this is how the femur and tibia should look at you when you have done your complete uh, exposure. When excising the lateral meniscus, you have to be careful of the lateral inferior genicular artery. So you should find it. In case you do not find it, you have to coagulate at this area so that the post-operative bleeding is less. Then you prepare the femur. So for the preparing the femur, you have to first enter the canal because most of the our manual instruments, they depend on the intramedullary alignment. So you draw a wide side line, you draw the trans epicondylar axis and just medial to the uh, wide side line and about a centimeter above the PCL insertion, you have to make a kind of uh, mark with the gouge and then so that your uh, drill does not slip and then you enter the, into the canal. And then uh, you have to do the dis uh, distal femoral cut. For that, there is a jig, and generally you set it is set in the nine millimeter. That is the usual thickness of the femoral component. And here there are options of zero, plus two, minus two, and that you can set the cutting. But most of the time we cut nine millimeter. And after the cutting, you should get, get a kind of a horseshoe shaped uh, distal femur. Uh, this kind of shape should be there. And in case you are doing the PCL resecting design, that is this uh, PS design, then uh, you have to cut the PCL off. And in case there is any doubt about the what is the valgus angle you will set in the distal femoral jig, then you can take the full length x-ray of the femur and uh, decide what is the valgus angle. Generally, I give five degree valgus. Then this is the, then we cut the Proximal tibia. For the cutting the proximal tibia, you have to have three retractors. One is the posterior, lateral, and medial. And uh, this is the this is the kind of view you should be having for the cutting the tibia. Whole tibia should be seen by you and should be looking at the sky. And this is extra medullary alignment jig, in which uh, the, the, the uh, this is aligned to the second toe. This is aligned to the tibial crest, and this is in the ACL PCL line. Uh, and uh, between the junction of medial and middle, one third of the tibial tuberosity. So that is how you align, and then you, this is the gouge. 
in which you calculate uh, how much of the TBI you will be resecting. Generally, we resect 9 millimeter from the healthy side and about 2 millimeter from the defective side. However, you should never attempt to reach to the defective side if it is very deep. And the posterior slope can be given by can be given here. Then once you have cut the distal femur and proximal tibia, the, your, you check the extension space. The extend is, and you keep the spins there so that in case required, you can revisit the cut. And this should be rectangular rather, rather than trapezoidal. And then you insert the spacer and you know okay, whether this space is uh, enough for uh, admitting your smallest spacer. And in case it is there, then you can take out the spins. Then is the sizing of the femur. The, there are two referencing systems, anterior referencing and posterior referencing. The most popular one is the anterior referencing, in which the anterior cut is static and posterior cut is variable. In posterior referencing, you reference posterior upwards. So the posterior cuts, the condylar cuts remains constant and the anterior, anterior one is variable. This is how the posterior referencing in which the anterior cut is variable. In posterior referencing, uh, the risk of notching is more. In anterior referencing, the posterior condylar cut is variable. Then you are, once you are you have size the femur, you have to determine in what rotation you are going to place your femur. That is very important. So there are four reference points. The one is the white side line, trans epicondylar axis, and then uh, most of the surgeons they give three degree external rotation to the, uh, in reference to the posterior condyle, and then is the parallel to cut, uh, parallel to tibia cut technique. So this is all the things you can see. The, these are the, you have to align your jig uh, to the trans epicondylar axis, and your center of jig should be in the uh, uh, white side line, and this is the three degree fixed external rotation, and this is the parallel to TBL cut technique. So all four, th uh, at least, these three things should be seen. And uh, for the valgus knee, this is the technique which is most prevalent. Then once you have done this, you, you place your jig as per the size. This cutting block, AP cutting block, differs as per the size of the femur. And then you check the flexion space. Never forget to check the flexion space before you, before you commit to the cut. So this should be, again, rectangular and sh should not be a, having any tightness medially or laterally uh, that you can release or you can change the rotation of the jig for the, in a kind of, depending on the which side is tight. If the medial side is tight, you have to do more external rotation like that. Then you start cutting. The first cut is the anterior or trochlear cut. Then is the posterior condylar cut. And then is the, then uh, the anterior and posterior chamber. And some of the designs, they have a trochlear cut also. So that, improves the patella tracking. The most important part of cutting the uh, posterior condyle is the protection of the medial collateral ligament. The medial collateral ligament is the mother of the knee. If your medial collateral ligament goes, your knee comes cr crumbling down. So therefore, every time you are doing the cut, whether it's a posterior cut, distal cut, or TBL cut, you have to be very mindful of the, uh, this retractor. Your assistant should be in the knowledge, and you should be constantly watchful because your can saw, saw can go adrift, and you can sever this ligament. So these are the various cuts being completed. And then once you are done the complete cut, you have to do posterior release. By a curved osteotome, you have to see that the, all the posterior capping osteophytes and the part of the femur which is going to be uncovered are cleared. So that is the posterior capsular recess clearance. And then again, you check the flexion space. And then cut the, in case you are doing a PS design, so that you have to do a notch cut. Again, in the notch cut, you see this, this is the depth of the notch. You have to use a thinner saw. And you have to align to the, the groove of the notch. And do not cut deep. If you go in this direction, you will cut deep. And then the, you ha risk having a con uh, condylar fracture and a stress riser. So you cut like that. And then uh, this is the how the notch should look. The depth, here the, the your blade should not get adrift and it uh, should cut deep. 
Uh, in case you are doing a CR design, then uh, the T-well trial is placed first, followed by the femoral. And in a substituting the uh, design, you keep, keep the you place the femoral trial and followed by the tibia. And this is a very popular test you must be knowing is the polo test, pull out, lift up test. And a corollary to that is push in test. So once you have done the trials, you should do a kind pull the tibia forward and see how much of the electricity this. Uh, uh, components are having. If it is coming very easily, then uh, your flexion space is rather loose, or your PC uh, that is not a balancing. And similarly, the in the lift up of the uh, TBL plate suggests that the posterior structures are tight, so you have to do more posterior release or release the PCL from the femur in case you are doing CR design. Then the final thing is you have to check the anatomical axis. It should go to the hip center. It should go to the ankle center. So this is how you must do the check. And after that, the most important part is the patellar tracking. Here we should we should know the rule of no thumb test. So there should be no thumb. There should not be any towel clip, things like that here. And your patella should track freely. And then you have to assess the stability of the implant in both flexion and extension. And then you must look for the FFD or recurvatum when you are doing the trialing. Then you have to determine the TBL rotation in relation to the femoral component. This is again very important point. So when, wherever the TBL uh, plate center line falls, there you have to draw a line with a cautery so that you know that the, this is the ideal TBL rotation in relation to the femur. And in case you are doing patellar resection, then you have to measure the thickness of patella Generally, in female, it is 20 to 24, uh, 22 to 24 millimeter. In male, it is 24 to 26 millimeter. The idea is to have the same thickness after the resection of patella. You can cut with the jig. You can cut with the free hand. So I do with the free hand. The, uh, the choice is yours. Then is the preparation of the tibia. So this is very important, the sizing of the tibia. You should see the medial, medial lateral, posterolateral, and anteromedial side. In nowhere, this TBL component should overhang. And at the same time, you should not place it smaller in the bargain to not to touch anywhere. So if you, the, the component has to be of ideal size. It should be, uh, it should be flush here, flush at the posterolateral side, and it should be covering the maximum amount of the tibia. So that is the si correct size of the tibia. And you see this line. That is the line which we had drawn with the cautery when we were checking the component, TBL component rotation in relation to the femur. So this line you should never forget. So whenever you are uh, preparing the tibia, you refer your central hole to this line. And place a lateral pin first with the posterolateral corner in line with the, your TBL base plate and the anteromedial side with this so that your maximum amount of tibia is capped. And then you browse the tibia, and with this keel preparation, you make a keel for the tibia. And then again, you check the alignment. The, you put a drop rod, and it should fall to the second toe. And ligament balancing, from the time you have given the incision, you should be working on the ligament balancing. That is by the osteophyte excision, releasing the ligament as required, and the varus and vulgus stability in flexion is achieved by the femoral component rotation as far as possible. And the fine tuning of the ligaments are done when you have placed the trial implant. So this is the way the, your cascade of the ligament balancing should progress. And even after doing this, we may face certain situations like this, where both the gaps are tight. You know the proximal tibia cut affects both the gap. So therefore, if both, both are tight, you have to resect more tibia. If extension gap is loose and flexion gap is loose, then you, the problem is simple. You just put the thicker poly. When extension space is tight, flexion gap is normal, you resect more distal femur. The, uh, the difficult situation is when your flexion space is tight and extension space is normal, then you have to dry and the femur, means you have to revisit the all cuts. Then only you can place a smaller uh, femur, or you have to increase the posterior slope, but this also comes with a caveat that the slope may increase more than 10 degree, and uh, 
you can risk more roll rollback and the problem is in kinematics. And this extension gap is normal and this is loose. This is solved by the larger femur or if you have got access to the posterior augments, you can put, put posterior augments. And cocktail, the various types of co cocktails are there in the prevalence. However, we use Ranawat cocktail in which we, the essential component is bupivacan, morphine uh, analog, epinephrine, and clonidine. We do not mix steroids in most of, uh, almost all cases, and antibiotic we include. So this should be ready on table, and you must use it. This. And the word about the pulse lavage. So once you are done complete cut, all the your trialing is complete, your ligament balancing is complete, and you are happy, then uh, you see this, the cuts are effused with the blood. So interdigitation of cement will not be good. So therefore, you have to do a very thorough lavage, uh, pulse la pulsatile lavage of the femur and tibia, so that the femur and tibia look white, and they, it is the interices are not filled with the blood. So and before you plant, uh, implant the final component, never forget to infiltrate, infiltrate the posterior capsule. Because after the implant, you will not be able to do that. And you will find certain sclerotic area. There you have to make a small drill holes with a 1.8 drill bit. Then is the, uh, you open the final component and do not open the poly. Then is the cement. So first, in the PS design, we implant the femur. And the, the cement has to be placed in a harsh manner. And you have to pres uh, pressurize with the thumb. And uh, in the implant also, you uh, place some cement. And the very thin cement is placed on the posterior side. Because if the cement uh, effuses from the posterior side, it is difficult to remove. So on the posterior side, you should be careful in applying the cement. And uh, once you hammer the component, you take out the, all the extruded cement. And tibial surface, the cement is placed on the metaphysis of the keel and on the tibial plate too. And again, uh, finger pressurized. And then you push, push the tibial component. When you are pushing the tibial component, you should not use a straight hammer. You should not be hammering straight away. Rather than you should be pushing with the hand and so that the, your keel does not get disturbed. Because if you are uh, hammering, then you implant. If it does not go to the exact keel side, then it have, will have mal rotation. And then knee, and you then you put the trial poly, and bring the knee to the full extension, and you apply a little bit of the valgus force with the hyperextension force so that the implant does not sink into the varus. And after the poly polymerization, you again do the pulsatile lavage, and you have to keep moving the knee so the all the cement debris they fall out. And this is how you do that, and then you. After the, you have, you have, by now you have known what is the size of the, uh, thickness of the poly. Then you implant the final poly. The other important thing is the draining and watertight closer. The, whether you put the drain or not is the individual size of the surgeon. Uh, uh, you may put the drain, you may not put, but the watertight closer is very important. If you are, uh, you forget the watertight closer, this is the angle of sorrow. From here, the most of the knee joint leak. So therefore, you, you should strive it that you do a very good watertight closer. With this, I thank you. And in case of any question, I'll be too glad to answer that. Thank you, sir, for a very detailed stepwise talk with a lifetime of experience uh, with this we move on to the live surgery with the opulent gold knee uh, done by dr preetam agrawal good morning uh, dr preetam you are live yes i am audible yes you are audible okay so we'll start then so this is a case, I will start with a brief history and the x-rays. Uh, this is a 59 year old female patient and she is suffering from knee pain since last 15 years. And uh, it's a varus knee, there is a 5 degree of flexion deformity and around 25 degree of varus deformity which is partially correctable and the flexion is up to 120. 
through the x-ray x-ray Hmm. Can you see the X-rays? Uh, no, it's too dark. Now? Yes. Yeah. Now it's better. Yeah. So, can you in the X-ray you can see it's a medial compartment arthritis mainly, and there are few osteophytes on the medial side and particular compartment. In the scanogram, it's a use virus around 25, 30 degree. So now we'll start. Our plan is uh, we'll do it by subastus approach, and we are not using any tunique. And uh, the blood pressure is 90 by 60, hypotensive anesthesia, and we have infiltrated the skin with saline and ADR. Hi, Dr. Pritam. Hi, sir. Uh, this Good is morning. Brigadier Dr. Agrawal, and along with me, Dr. Shinukumar. Good is morning, there. sir. Good morning. Yeah. And uh, why you are not using tourniquet? I mean, you have any special reservation or you routinely perform surgery without tourniquet? I know you can do without tourniquet. So initially I used to use tourniquet, but since last four years, I have stopped using it. Because I find it that after surgery, the pain is very less if you are doing without tourniquet. And uh, we don't need to use a drain. There is less chances of post-op hematoma. And I find it very comfortable without tunique nowadays. So I have stopped using it at all. So I will start. So normally the incision in parapetellar is midline. But in subastus, it's slightly medial. So I will take a skin incision. Change the blade. Focus here. So I will go till the fascia over the quadriceps. I will just split this fascia. Can you appreciate this fascia? Yeah, we, we do. Now I'll infiltrate saline ADR in between this fascia and the quadriceps muscle. So I have to make a plane between this. And I have to elevate a fascia cutaneous flap medially. Do you use subvastus approach for every case? Are there any exclusion criteria where you would not do the subvastus? Uh, till now, sir, I have not found any case where I have to find an excuse. So I am doing my revision also with subastus only. But there are patients who are very obese, the patient who have undergone lot of massage where the fascia and the quadricep is stuck, contracted. If the skin condition is not good on the medial and side. And your skin is not mobile over the vastus then? If the skin condition is not good on the medial side, at that time I can, if any flap surgeries or skin grafting has been done, that time I will, uh, I will use parapetellar or else I will always use subastus. So with this sponge, I will just free this fascia from the quadriceps. Hi, Pritam. A qu one question. Yeah. As you put your incision on the medial side, yeah. can we put that incision on central, central midline? We can do it, but uh, it's uh, I the proximal part of the incision is on the medial side. Yeah. The distal part is standard. Okay, why I'm asking because cosmetically this kind of incision looks a bit odd to the, you know, mm -hmm. exposed patient. Yes. Because if you are only exposing on the medial side, mm. you can elevate on that side. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just uh, this freeing this fascia from the quadriceps. And with my finger only, I will dissect the quadriceps from the medial intermuscular septum. 
can you appreciate the i am holding the whole quadriceps with my finger yes. i'll put put a right angle to retract the quadriceps muscles and next i will do a l shaped capsulotomy this is the horizontal limb and this is the vertical limb it is little bloody due to the without tunicate but once we'll flex the knee there will be no bleeding cautery forcep spine seizure uh dr pritham uh, dr sinu here could yes. you just tell me the, what is the uh, proximal extent of your inverted l uh, where you took it vertically so sir the uh, horizontal part is towards the superior pole of patella just okay. lower border of the vmo this is the vmo lower border right, right that is the part where i will do the horizontal capsule for me okay thanks i will use this 90 degree retractor to retract my quadriceps and i will do some fat pad excision at this time only i have started releasing my deep mcl along with the anterior horn of the medial meniscus so it's say around 20 degree varus so we have to do medial release so once my patella is retracted to the lateral gutter then i can flex the knee sponge for some cautery so i am doing the medial release sub periosteal elevation of the deep mcl i am cutting the acl figure of 4 so i do my medial release in figure of 4 position periosteum external pit cautery slow as the chesser said always in knee replacement we have to take care of our mcl that is the most important part hmm. so now you can appreciate almost i can correct my varus deformity maybe last 5 degrees still there 
so i do femur first distal femur cut then distal tibia cut hammer yes. Starting. So we are going to take six degree valgus and nine mm cut for the distal femur. I follow the major dissection technique mostly. So the distal femur cut will be nine mm. Spike. Doctor Pritam, do you do not do washing up the canal before putting the rod inside? Uh, sir, this is a small drill, so I didn't do that. Pins zero. Angel wing. So my this retractor will protect the MCL. Yes. Uh, Doctor Pritham, uh, what is the pre-op uh, FFD for this patient or this? Around is five degree. Five degrees. Yeah. Okay. So you so stick I'm to your standard. Yes, nine I'm so. not going to take any plus two. Okay. No, so. How was the ACL in this patient, Dr. Pritam? ACL was totally pristine. Uh, we could have done partial yeah, leaves. Yeah, also, right? Okay. I always measured my cut with a caliper. You will check that, don't This is medial. Medial is around 6 mm, lateral. It's 7 mm. So first we'll do the proximal tibia cut, then we will think about any plus 2. So this 5. Hold on. So the most tricky part in this surgery in subastus is the exposure of the TB of the lateral side. So what we do? Always while flexing the knee, we have to keep the limb in external rotation. So it protects your uh, patellar tendon. So I will incise this anterior horn of the lateral meniscus. Yeah. Then I will hold it with a cocker or meniscus grasper and while my assistant will flex the knee, I will 
pull this lateral meniscus, my tibia will come out. Uh, Dr. Pritham, just one thing about that heavy duty uh, L shaped retractor you have laterally. Yeah. So, when did you readjust it from the femoral side to the tibial side? Uh, so just after the distal femur cut. Okay, okay. Yeah. And you continue with the same one single retractor throughout? Yeah, one retractor on the lateral, on side. The lateral side, one on the posterior side. Right. Okay. Thanks. See, I am pulling this uh, lateral meniscus and my whole tibia is coming out. As you are doing PS knee, so I am going to cut the PCL. So next we'll do the proximal tibia cut, sponge. So come to the So for tibial slope, I use my two finger, which guide me around three degree of posterior tibial slope. hammer for the thumb tick so we're going to cut 9 mm from the lateral tibial condyle so it's a major resection 9 mm from the lateral tibia 9 नीचे करो, नीचे, नीचे, हाँ, पिन, जीरो Alignment and let's go Nikalu. Angel wing. I think with this we are not going to cut any medial part. Pritham, sir, uh, in this just a point to mention for a uh, starter because what mm -hmm. we do here is we leave only that tibial cutting jig over there. Mm -hmm. If it is a mm -hmm. whole, uh, this uh, assembly jig is well aligned over there and you are clamping it to the uh, malleolar point, mm -hmm. then it is much safer because otherwise, with the saw, you are actually not getting the desired slope. Yeah. So I think that's a system flaw. Mm -hmm. th from the company. Most of the companies now I'm seeing that once you uh, mount the upper tibial cut mm -hmm. and you have to remove it okay. and you have no control on the slope exactly. Okay. 
uh, and rather i would say you have to fix it with a two points or let's say four points mm -hmm. on the tbs so that the slope control is uh, well managed okay yes 3 degree 3 yeah. degrees in build but what i am telling that it tilts because of when you are cutting with the saw that no gives no. a not a perfect control and mm, anyhow you move dr pitam when you cut the tibia you cut from soft to hard or hard to soft uh normally i do the lateral first soft part then i go to the lateral to hard that is very important because yeah. if you cut from hard to soft then your saw will sky walk कैलिपर सो माई टीबीएल कट इज एक्जैक्ट इट्स नाइन एम so now we will check the extension space yeah yeah it's little tight on the medial side otherwise it's fine so i'm not going to do any recut on the distal femur or proximal tibia i will accept this right now because with uh, all the other cuts uh, there will be some medial release of the external rotation and osteophytes removal uh, but uh, pritham do you think on this only extension gap yeah. if you can define whether you are taking an extra distal femur or not yeah if if i think it's in flexion deformity only i will take extra exactly. distal exactly so once you measure the flexion gap then only we will define that whether we yeah. are going to take an extra femur distal femur or not yeah okay because Uh, as you measured your distal femur the cut was on the lateral side was only 7 mm yes, yes. but we means uh, expected to cut it at least 9 mm mm yes so now we'll size the femur pehle mujhe trial do d I always check the medial lateral width of the femur with the trial implant. It gives me an approximate size what implant I'm going to use. This is D. E, dekho. E is large, so mostly it will be D or C. Size it. for sir so we have to clear this uh, lateral part of the femur piche taraf sir nahi sir it's size d 3 i am going to take 3 degree external rotation when the size comes in between then how do you do the uh, progress further suppose it uh, is between d and e or between e and f 
sir if you'll take the larger uh, smaller size then there is chances of uh, notching so i prefer to take the larger one if it's towards the larger side pin but we are using anterior referencing so anterior point is fixed yeah no notching and then if you are taking for a larger size then definitely it will be a flexion tightness yeah if you will take the smaller one then we are going to cut more on the posterior side exactly yeah so your flexion gap will be more not more but i would say it is uh, comfortable in uh, deflection hmm. yes prefer to use the smaller in between angel so the our appeal uh, dr pritam you have already made the pack holes yes so you are completely committed now yes sir hai na and <laughs> uh, what about the flexion space you did not check the flexion gap i think it will be all right we respect your judgment yes tractor so this retractor will protect the mcl it's a very important step while doing this posterior cut what are the precautions you, you should take when you are doing the posterior condylar cut most important is we have to protect the mcl and the lateral side the patellar tendon and the feel of the saw once you are done with the bone cut you have to not go more posterior so how do you know that the bone is completely cut sir the it will be like the bone is free you, you can get the feel can you the feel and second it will move yeah it the condyle would move yeah. so the moment the condyle moves you know that the cut is complete So now I'm taking the chamfer cut. Flex. So the next is the trochlear cut. This uh, will help in the pat patellofemoral tracking.
वीडियो ट्रांसमिशन क्वालिटी इज वेरी गुड सॉरी वीडियो ट्रांसमिशन क्वालिटी इज वेरी गुड ओके एक्सीलेंट उठाओ So I'll complete this uh, trochlear cut with the free hand. Rasp. Notch cut. फीमर उठो पंच हैमर हम्म नो नो पिंस So this osteotomy is protecting the tibial condyle. Hmm. Remove. Take it. Hmm. Remove it. So now the most important part we have to do the posterior osteophyte release and the posterior capsular release. Give it a sponge. Give it a sponge. So you can appreciate this white line. So the part, anything behind the white is the posterior osteophytes. Yeah, the uh, one of the image is upside down. That can be rotated. The left side. Uh, the camera one. Isko focus karo. Camera yaha focus karo andar. Dr. Pritam, you can lift the femur up with a bone hook, then your posterior release will become easy and the you, have will you will have more visibility. Yes sir, but I don't do that. I Second option is that you hyperflex the knee and push the upper tibia. Cautery. Till now, I have not removed the meniscus. Now I am doing it. So we should retract. Uh, Dr. Pritam, if they could just uh, either rotate the camera one completely. So that uh, is not possible. Or uh, then just show us this one image because the other image is really sort of confusing right now. Yeah, yeah. 
a little bit of uh, it's zoomed in a bit too much but zoom kar no no zoom, zoom out, out zoom you have to zoom, zoom out. out yeah perfect now you can see yeah yeah that's good better i don't find problem with uh, this step doing this nibbler cottery nibbler yes lateral so we are not going to release anything from the lateral side just will check it's fine <coughs> trial taken nibbler the medial tibial osteophytes i am removing yeah. hmm. femur so i feel it's little tight so there's a big osteophytes on this posterior medial tibia uh, can dr appreciate? pritam now we can use the camera from above yeah. even if it's rotated yeah the other one the camera one that you had before camera one now you can see is visible trial hmm tick we go to the top top it's little tight so i will take a tibia plus 2 cut uh so we the tightness is it just on the medial side or is it uh, on either of the it's uh, on both side okay the lateral spine here hmm i think and that the hmm. प्रेसकर अभी कट अभी कट नहीं है
normally I use the TBL recutter plus for plus two mm, but they don't have. So this pin. You don't know. Hammer. Hmm. Reverse. Hmm. Okay. Median side is very sclerotic. Uh, Dr. Pritam, at this point, uh, because since you've already recut your tibia, yeah. uh, can you consider completing your tibia right now? Because two no, things, I one you can save time and second is, uh, you know, the uncapped bone on the medial side, if you mm. take it out, mm. that will give you some medial laxity as well. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. right, but I w still I would like to take a trial, trial before. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I will do some medial release. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Hmm. Excellent rotated, yes. So now, now my medial release is complete. I hope now I can reduce the knee. Nibbler. Sponge. I will do some pike rusting of this superficial MCL because I feel it's very tight with 18 number needle. And there is some MCL osteophyte still there.
can appreciate this MCL, it's very tight. So now, now this is my trial, uh, I can get almost full extension, there is no flexion deformity and the movement is full, a nice patellar tracking with this sub -asters. Uh Dr. Pritham, in extension is there any opening on the lateral side? Uh, mm, no sir, not okay. at all. That's nice. So now we are ready, uh, we'll do the final tibial preparation then we'll do the implanting. Do we have time? Yeah, I think uh, it's an opulent knee. Uh, the people would like to see it once. Yeah. 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 The actual gold. Chal. <laughs> Hmm. 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 Sponge, forceps. So we have to have a 360 degree view of the tibia for this final tibial cut, forceps, cautery. Cautery. Is four the cup three, I guess. Best see the girl, hmm. yeah, up a group. Three. Mm. Any blood? So we're going to take size three tibia. Pins. Hmm. Doctor, Pritam, lateral, how, how, how do you decide the rotation of the tibia? Uh, I and how do you size the tibia? For the rotation, we have to take the medial one third of the tibial tuberosity, and for the sizing, the lateral tibial condyle width. That is important. We have to exclude these osteophytes or the excess width of the medial side. So the lateral condyle part, it will decide your size of the tibia. But we have already balanced the knee and if you are debulking on the medial side, mm -hmm. is it not going to uh, create a laxity? Still you have done a pie crusting also. Sir, it's s still little tight. So I think after this it will be more balanced. Okay.
ให้มันSo we're going to drill this uh, hard sclerotic part on the t b e l side for better cementing. Implant level, p o s s i b l Wash. Patella. So I am not going to resurface the patella. I will just remove the osteophytes and denervate it. Uh, Doctor Pritham, any criteria of uh, resurfacing or non-resurfacing, or are you uh, always a non-resurfacer? Uh, now I am not resurfacing. Initially, I used to do, but uh, I have stopped. Doing that, okay. Again, very important to understand for the audience is that uh, we need to know what kind of implant we are using. Yes. Uh, you have to go through the implant uh, kind of morphology or anatomy because yeah. there are certain implants which are highly patella unfriendly. So those are implants in which you have to resurface always. Yeah. But uh, the one that we are currently using has got a very good uh, anterior profile. So yeah. there, you can definitely leave the native patella as it is. So we did this trochlear cut, so that is patella friendly for this. Okay. Wash. This c a r e y a o t r e Drill ready. Suction. Uh, are so you going to use lavage for no bone cleaning? No. 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 I use 50 ml syringe and I lavage with that only. So that's a regular practice. Or yes, it's a regular practice. So I'm drilling this sclerotic uh, tibial bone with multiple holes. But why not pass l a v a s Dr. Pritham? That is good, sir. Uh, I find no difficulty in doing this. So I feel it's no, not the required. Plantation will not be difficult, but the blood which is there will be washed away by the pulse pulsatile l a v a s only. I give a Pressure lavage with this syringe only. 90. Ultimately, I will it will it will uh, translate into your cementing quality. Yes, sir. I will show you at the time of cementing. The. Chimaru thao, chimaru thao. Implant ready. Cement here. Yeah. Take minute. p o n g ready.
ni Blood. Selain ni Blood. Selain main tak ya? Yes. Cepat mixing cakap kerja. Selain So sir, what do you prefer for cementing the femur or tibia? Femur always, okay. in a PS knee. Same with me. We'll do the femur first, then tibia. No, in both cases. Uh, I do prefer in either side. If it is a tight knee, when you are flexing and your tibia is not coming out properly especially especially in a obese female that's yeah. difficult so the posterior clearance for the tbl implantation is difficult so in that Punch. case you have to do tibia first and then femur okay but if you are comfortable in both the position because t in that cases dpi you uh, tbi you need a deflection because yeah. tbi will not come out Mm. No doubt there are consensus that says that once you are doing a femur first, uh, it will give a um, proper pressurization on the femur and not in the tibia, that eventually you are going to extend the knee and uh, that will compress on both sides. Yeah. So we are ready with the cementing. So we are going to implant the gold knee, opulent gold knee from Merrill. Chal, come on. Hmm. Sir, now you can see without any pulse lavage also, I can get a good per bed for cementing. So which cements using we are? Sir, it's a Palacos. Okay, simple Palacos without antibiotic. With antibiotic. Which one? Okay. Gentamicin. So without tourniquet and without pulse lavas, I, I do my cementing. Do implant. So this is the gold knee. Dr. Pitam, can you tell little bit more about this gold knee? Sir, uh, this is my first gold knee. Yeah, but so I read a little bit about it. Mm -hmm. so this is uh, hardness of this gold knee is much better than the cobalt chromium that we are using and the zirconium it's two times more harder than the zirconium and it's more biocompatible and the third thing is it is very the allergic part is very less as per the literature and they say that the longevity is very high because the wear and tear is less Punch. Come on. So no, I, no, I have no personal experience, but with time we will get to know. Uh, just to add on that about the goal knees, so uh, this was introduced, I think, for basically allergic problems in the West. 
about 15 years back yeah and uh, so they have a follow up data of uh, the only problem with uh, this current uh, m design that we are using is it's a new method of uh, okay. you know yeah. uh, coating okay. the cobalt okay. chromium is coated with something called as titanium niobium uh, which is uh, by a method called as plasma vapor deposition yeah. and there was this journal uh, bio biomaterials i think this journal of biomaterials had an article about 6 year about 7 years back and they showed that Cement. it tended to flake off so it was a bit of a worry in the initial part Cement. but then now there are uh, clinical studies which shows uh, uh, no problem as such so i think it is a pretty safe need to use and like we yeah. mentioned the uh, allergic properties and of course the wear patterns are excellent with this uh, particular material there <coughs> other thing dr pritham do you completely cement the tibia or it's only on the platform no i do a complete okay uh yeah because there is uh, yeah some people leave the keel while doing a cementation but uh, yeah. th because they consider the revision to be a problem but i think doing a uh, complete cementation is always better yeah. especially in rheumatoid knees and the newer designs like uh, you know which has very short keels Hmm. If you don't put cement all the way till the uh, end of the keel, yeah. chances of loosening out is very high. Yeah. There. there is no flexion deformity we can take questions from the audience if they there is there any questions is there any question from anybody i must compliment dr pitam the surgical demonstration was excellent Thank and you your sir. team is also excellent and so is your anesthesia team uh, they have been able to give a good hypotensive anesthesia yeah the surgery was bloodless yeah. partly because of this your uh, sir, our art, of, is art of surgery and anesthesia and uh, the whole whole hall was i mean they were sitting spell bound and uh, the audio visual team also needs to be complimented their uh, the transmission was good both sounds and the the video quality thank you very much thank you sir and you thank deserve you. a very big round of applause thank you sir i i would also uh, like to thank my ot staff and my chief anesthetist dr cp batti without him it's very it's difficult to do these surgeries and the uh, max team meril team everyone thank you sir thank and you and we must also compliment dr uh, sunil khemka for arranging such a good quality conference and a good audio visual and good qu quality surgery and the academic stuff thank you sir after a wonderful surgical demonstration from dr pritham let's uh, proceed with the academic lectures is it better now yeah so now uh, i i would like to invite uh, dr anand gupta from uh, bombay hospital indore for his talk on correction of valgus deformity in tkr Good morning, everyone. Uh, let me first congratulate Dr. Pritham for demonstrating such a nice surgery in a varus deformity. Now, uh, I will talk a little bit different uh, on the uh, valgus deformity of the knee joint.
Okay. Uh, so, valgus knee is little different from the uh, uh, varus knee. So, I will talk something in brief about the correction of valgus deformity while doing a knee replacement. So, in valgus deformity, uh, it is less common than the uh, uh, varus deformities. The bone dot deformity is primarily in the femur. So, there is a usually a lateral femoral hyperplasia. And soft tissue problems are, it is tight on the lateral side and stretched on the medial side. So, as I told you, the primary deformity is usually in the femur. So unlike virus deformity where the primary deformity lies in the tibia, the deformity in valgus knee is in the distal uh, femur, usually distal deficiency and posterior deficiency. And it complicates the femoral component positioning. So <clears throat> in distal deficiency, there is a sloping of the joint line, which must be corrected. And the final joint line should be parallel to the floor. So this is how you know the, uh, the the sloping of the joint line is there, which you need to correct. The posterior lateral deficiency it cannot so because of the posterior lateral deficiency of the femoral uh, 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 this thing, uh, you cannot rely on the posterior referencing for the femoral component positioning. So if you rely on the posterior um, uh, referencing uh, of the uh, femur. It will result in the femoral uh, component internal rotation, and there will be a patellar mal tracking. So you have to use the epicondylar axis while putting the uh, femoral component. It avoids the uh, uh, femoral internal rotation and patellar mal tracking. So you have to check with the white sides line, and it helps to correct the soft tissue balance in the flexion. So what is white side line? It is a line with, you know, from deepest part of the trochlea to the highest point of the intercondylar notch. And it is usually at the right angles to the epicondylar axis. So, so if you see the, you know, the, the white side line, it is usually uh, at right angles to the, uh, so this is the white side line and this is the epicondylar uh, axis. So if you take a posterior referencing, which is usually there in, you know, when you take, uh, when you're operating on the varus knee, so it is generally at the three degree of uh, this thing, internal rotation. So <coughs> there you take a uh, three degree of external rotation, which is usually in varus knees. But when it comes to the valgus knee, you can see that, you know, the lateral femoral hyperplasia is there. So the rotation is, so you cannot rely on the, uh, posterior uh, referencing system. So if you take posterior reference and put your rotation as per the uh, your posterior referencing system, your component will be in the internal rotation. And then you will have a femoral mal rotation. So in tibia, in valgus knees, it is not the primary deformity. It may have a secondary changes. And there may be a lateral plateau deficiency. So now coming to the soft tissue balancing, it is more difficult than the varus knee. So you have to do a sequential releases. Your knee may be tight laterally and stretched out medially. It may be tight in both flexion and extension, or there may be a flexion contracture, which is again a complex uh, uh, deformity along with the uh, hyperextension, which is a different ball game altogether. So while coming to the surgical steps, so you need to take the bone cuts before the ligament release to facilitate the uh, uh, exposure. In principle, the stretched contracted lateral structures to be uh, structures to be you know uh, match with the uh, medial structures. So you need to release mainly on the lateral side and no release on the medi uh, on the medial side. And lateral osteophytes to be removed. Although lateral osteophytes do not um, uh, impact too much in the valgus knee as it impacts in the varus knees, because the lateral collateral ligament takes attachment on the femoral head. So it is far away you know, on the uh, uh, lateral side. So with the knee in extension, joint is distracted with the laminar spreader after taking the distal and uh, proximal tibial cut. The posterolateral capsule and the orchid ligaments are cut transversely at the joint line. And uh, 
the popliteus tendon is preserved at this juncture the it lateral aternoclam and, and lateral collateral ligament appears with the number 15 blade or with the number 16 needle for a pie crusting care must be taken not to penetrate the soft tissues beyond 1 cm depth particularly in the posterior lateral corner where the popliteal now lies at an average of 1.49 cm from the bony edge lateral side is further stretched using the second laminar spreader and the pie crusting is performed until the gaps are balanced on the lateral side in severe valgus deformity you may consider the you know lateral femoral epicondyle osteotomy but then the decision is you have to take early when you are operating on the uh, valgus knee before taking the uh, uh, soft tissue release so you need to decide whether you are going to do a uh, lateral femoral epicondyle osteotomy or you are doing uh, the soft tissue release and pie crusting so decision pie crusting versus osteotomy there is no clear guideline but there are you know few factors which you can consider so you cannot perform both the procedures in combination non correctable deformity is greater than 20 degrees require an osteotomy stiff knees with flexion contracture requires osteotomy with a lesser deformity and knees with hyperextension and full range of movement they can generally fully corrected with the pie crusting and soft tissue release only these are few examples you can see this patient there is one side there is a valgus deformity and the other side is a varus deformity with along with the uh, flexion deformity this was his gait pattern prior to the surgery this is post surgery you can see the full correction deformity is fully corrected and this is his gait pattern following the surgery so you need to do a sequential release have some patience do a, a proper uh, femoral rotation and you can almost 100% correct the valgus deformity another patient this is a before surgery this is the gait pattern with the valgus knee and this is post surgery full correction so take home message assess the correctability of the deformity prior to the incision after the anesthesia so that you know where you know how much uh, release is and whether you need soft tissue release or you need osteotomy of the femoral epicondyle that you can decide pay due attention to the femoral component rotation first take the bone cuts and then do a sequential soft tissue release i think with this you can correct almost all the valgus knees thank you for patient care uh thank you dr gupta if there are any questions okay uh thank you dr gupta there doesn't there seem to be any questions uh, i would like to invite dr bhaskaran for his talk on uh, unique compartmental knee and why we should be offering it more to our patients first of all good morning everybody and uh, i would like to thank uh, kimka sir and uh, uh, chatisgarh orthopedic association for having us here and organizing this wonderful event uh, so i think we've been up till now talking about total knee arthroplasties and you know how it has been serving us for all these years uh, i just want to not uh, launch or uh, not talk about a new technology rather revisit something that has been successful for a while but it's really not come out much in the data as well as not a lot of surgeons have spoken about it 
this is a medial unicompartmental and why i'm talking about it is because our patient population the indian patient population we are majorly affected afflicted by you know anteromedial osteoarthritis and this becomes a very excellent tool in our surgical kind of armamentarium you know when we offer them uh, you know kind of minimally invasive procedures uh, so again any of our um, you know talks would start with uh, what total knee arthroplasty has done uh, over the years and how it has served us so well it's got a very reproducible technique so many surgeons all over the globe can do it with the same kind of outcomes and most of the innovations we are going to see in a few maybe another half an hour dr adkar demonstrating a robotic tkr most of these innovations have also led to you know improving on already what is an excellent technique but one thing that we have failed to address is we have been always looking all these new innovations or uh, you know uh, developments that have happened is mainly in the a uh, survival pattern so by improving the alignment i'm able to improve the survival but am i doing anything to improve the function of that patient how the patient gets up from a chair how he can climb stairs he's having that knee for a long period of time 20 years but how has it served that patient so that is what we need to look at so uh, there was a lot of studies the initial studies purely concentrated on revision rates so uh, most of the knee arthroplasty registers you'll see Uh, study saying 95% 96% success rate so only 4 to 5% have failed so when they say fail that means this knees had to be revised that knees completely failed but do those 96% who have that knee within them are still happy with the knee that's the question we need to ask so there is a difference between the surgeon's outcome versus a patient outcome a surgeon looks at a knee if it has survived for 20 years as a successful knee but for a patient if you ask him very specific questions which they did recently in a few questionnaires and they found out the dissatisfaction rates even though the patient was walking going about his activities but the dissatisfaction rate is almost 20 to 25% which is pretty high for any kind of procedure so what can we do how can we improve this uh, again another very important point is does good x rays so all these techniques computer navigation robotic is going to improve our x rays but does good x rays actually translate into you know good outcomes like for the example this knee is obviously banged in a little bit of varus here but the patient is pretty happy i see that tend to see that a lot in my bilateral knees the knee that i have done you know i've come out of the ot feeling that this is done really well it's almost textbook like and the other knee was not that great and after two weeks this patient comes to my opd points to the one that which i didn't feel so great about saying that this feels much better so there's really no kind of correlation between what uh, x ray image would be and how the patient would you know perceive that need to be so what do we do about it so there are certain people especially in europe johan bellemans i think if anybody is following arthroplasty he is the modern master we should be following we all should be following him right now follow him on his youtube uh, you know his video blogs everything uh, his papers so they are re revolutionizing the way we look at arthroplasty in terms of function and there's also this society that has come with something called as a personalized arthroplasty society where they would personalize a procedure for a particular patient it's not that all the patients would be banged in with the same mechanical aligned knees there. so how do we get there a lot of importance was given to the soft tissue sleeve we always knew that the soft tissue is pretty important in uh, tkr the in fact even some people called it as a soft tissue procedure not a bony procedure but here what they look at is disturbing it as less as possible so that you know by just giving everybody a straight mechanical alignment you tend to stretch on one side and maybe you know contract on the other side and that can lead to something called as soft tissue irritation and pain later so just aiming for absolute mechanical alignment in all the knees is not a very good idea mild to moderate deformities go for something called as kinematic alignment i'm still in the process of learning this so i wouldn't be an expert on that but i think it is definitely a future and when you're looking at good results in a total knee you have to think about doing kinematic alignment for your mild to moderate uh, you know deformities and they were very very clear if the disease is involving just one compartment if the bone on bone damage is just on the medial or the lateral side then always always consider a unicompartmental arthritis you don't have to do a total knee so coming to unicompartmental like i said you know it's not a a uh, technique that is just come in it has been there for more than 30 40 years when the original knee total knee had come itself 
Uh, so Oxford group was the initial guys who actually did a lot of pioneering work in that. If you look at the design, uh, you have something called as a highly congruent kind of uh, design on either side, the femoral side and the uh, TBL side. So it is completely congruent, so chances of wear is pretty less. It's not like a curve on a curve or a curve on a flat. And it's mobile bearing, so it sort of resembles the meniscus, the natural meniscus. And it also mimics the natural kinematics much better. Uh, the initial criteria of selecting patients, again in the 80s or the 90s, when people started doing unicompartmentals, they had very stringent criteria. Like patients above 60, they were not candidates. If you had a weight, body weight about 80 kg, again, you are not considered as a candidate. If there is exposed bone in patellofemoral area, then again, they were not given unis and highly active patients. So using all these data, all these kind of uh, criteria, only about 6% of patients qualified for unicompartmental. So the number of patients undergoing unicompartmental was quite less because they just did not fit into this criteria. And it was in 1988 with the Oxford group coming out with their paper which showed that you could do it in most of this. I mean, they could completely discount weight, they could discount uh, activity levels, age, and they had just three things that they had to look at. One is bone-on-bone -bone arthritis. If you're doing a, a you know, Oxford, it had to be anteromedial osteoarthritis. You need to have a reasonably functional ACL. It has not to be absolutely naturally structured kind of maintained ACL. Just a reasonably structure of the ACL has to be there. The MCL, of course, has to be intact. The MCL has to be intact for any kind of medial unicompartmental procedure. And the lateral compartment had to be uh, normal. The only contraindications for a unicompartmental was uh, inflammatory arthritic disease. If there is rheumatoid arthritis, if there is angst then they are not good candidates because the disease tended to involve all the compartments simultaneously, not just one. And then if the ACL is completely deficient, again, not a very good idea to do a unicompartmental. And on the patella, it was very interesting. They just looked at one point, that is the lateral patella facet. If it, there was bone deep there, then the patient was not a good candidate for a unicompartmental. Uh, so these are the x-rays that, you know, typically where we sort of question whether we should do a uni or a total knee. So about 10 years back in my practice, if a patient with this kind of wear pattern, where bone on bone, there is, uh, you know, it's a little bit of two to three millimeter gap in between. And at the same time, he's got medial joint line tenderness. I would have offered this patient a unicompartmental and if a patient comes like this with complete bone on bone damage and he's got a medial compartment, uh, medial joint line tenderness, I would do a total knee in them. But then after going through the Oxford literature and Oxford indications, in today's day when I practice, what I do is I give this, I send these patients to my, either to my arthroplastic colleagues or, you know, maybe do a gel injection in them or maybe said, get a HDO done. But I would never do an arthroplasty in a patient who does not have complete bone on bone kind of arthritis. So that's the, I think, single take-home point today is if you do not have bone-on-bone -bone damage, no matter what the patient is describing in terms of pain, never. Don't do a uni, don't do a total, but they're not a candidate for arthroplasty procedures. You should be only considering alternative measures. But when you see something like this, the lateral compartment is intact, and it's a bit correctable. So these are the patients now that I offer unicompartmental, and they do exceedingly well. So I'll, I'll just show some x-rays later. So a patient walking in, so these are the initial screening x-rays that we do. Again, you know, uh, this is a lying down x-ray, but she is on standing, she has complete bone on bone. Then we do a valgus uh, kind of stress and it opens up on the medial side and I can see two, two things that I check with this valgus stress is one is if the MCL is intact and second is the lateral compartment is intact in the sense that there's no bone on bone, you know, side of contact when I'm giving that valgus stress there. And on the lateral, along with the patella, we also look for posterior bone to be intact. The posterior, uh, posterior medial condyle of the, f uh, of the femur should not go behind the posterior part of the tibia. That means there's a little bit of posterior cartilage on the tibia intact. And that is, again, an indication of an intact ACL. So these three x-rays are very important. So once you see these x-rays, you're pretty clear that you can do a unicompartmental before, you know, before the taking up the patient itself. And you don't have to make changes on table. And intraoperatively, we look for an intact ACL. Again, it does not have to be pristine, normal ACL. It just has to be functionally good. And this is your tibial cut. We'll show you intact cartilage on the posterior side. This 
image is reversed, so it shows intact cartilage on the posterior side, which is indicative of uh, normal ACL. The Oxford UK, no doubt there is a learning curve. The TBL cut is the challenge, uh, which over a period of time you would get that. And then the MCL tension is something that you get only purely by feel. I mean, there's no teaching that is something that you have to learn. But once you get that, you know, you can get your natural kinematics in there much better as compared to a total knee. Now, discussing about the, you know, the biggest problem when you talk in terms of a unique compartment, any, any, I mean, it's the elephant in the room, is that the revision rates. Most of the studies initially in the 80s, 90s came out with revision rates showing almost three times that of a total knee replacement. Then why do a uni? If I do a uni and it's going to fail after you know seven, eight years or 10 years and the patient has to go for a total, then why do a uni in the first place? So when looking at this data, they had to sort of read between the lines as to why these rates were so high. So at that point again in the 80s or 90s, the uni compartmental was offered to patients in a highly younger kind of age group who were high demand patients and they also were sold this procedure telling them that it's sort of a stopgap procedure we are going to do it for you now you do, you are too young to undergo a total knee and maybe after 10 years we'll revise it to a total knee and so when these patients had the you know the earliest problem of pain or stiffness or anything of that sort happening both the surgeon and the patient was readily willing to sort of revise it into a total knee and that's why they found out that there was a lot of lot of uh, you know patients readily undergoing uh, revisions for the uni and that pushed up the revision rate quite high. And this is again a very other you know, sort of interesting kind of graph. The number of surgeons doing uni compartmental as a percentage to the total number of uh, total knees that you see. If you look a plot a chart and see, if you're doing less than five unis in a year, five or seven unis in a year, then your revision rate is pretty high. It is going almost, so a normal TKR revision rate is between one to two percent. Unis it is going up to five. But as you increase your numbers of uni compartmentals, you come near that figure of 20%. So that revision rate comes almost as equal to a total knee there. So from 20 to 40, so that's what you have to increase your number of uni compartmentals among your total knee patients that are coming in that you are earlier doing total knee and you should try and convince them for a uni compartmental. But at the same time, the interesting part of the graph is towards the end it starts speaking up again. So these are the surgeons, you know, beyond 60, 70 percent. These are the surgeons who are sort of, you know, fixed with the idea of doing unicompartmental, and they want to do a uni in almost all the patients. So that's when you can start having these failures again. So you should not go in with a fixed mindset. Use those X-rays, do your pre-op checks, and find out the ideal candidate, and then do it. So if you stay within this 20 to 50 kind of percent, uh, you would have excellent re results with that. And then these are more recent trials. The top cat being the you know, the most uh, significant one, which was a proper RCT. And that showed, uh, you know, results in terms of functional outcomes, complication rates, almost uh, equal, if not better than a total knee. And uh, the interesting part was even the surgeons felt that uh, the UKR, after a particular period of time, was technically just as demanding as a total knee, because that's a big phobia that we surgeons have, that we don't want to spend more time or more stress in the OT doing something that's so, you know, difficult that we feel. But over a period of time, it is just as yes, equal as technically demanding as a total knee. So all these results have been, you know, from the Oxford group. And there's this argument that says that it's only the Oxford people who would have these results. But then if you look at these data from SWAD and Price, this is a unit in Sweden and they have numbers more than the original Oxford group and their survival analysis was even much better. So it's not just the Oxford group that would have this very high kind of excellent results. In India then you have uh, Mulaji, Dr. Guru Aredi, all these people have very high rates, more than about uh, 100, uh, more than 1000 uh, unicompartmentals with excellent results. So but uh, I think it's only Dr. Mulaji who's got to publish it yet but the rest have done enough numbers with very, very good uh, results. Uh, again, coming to my crux of the talk is that why we should consider it is because like I said, we are blessed with, I would use the word blessed, is blessed with various needs. Most of our arthritis starts in the anteromedial compartment and that's where it's an ideal situation to do uh, uni. And this is not just saying it is, there's a paper which has shown, again, Mulaji et al has shown that the basic uh, deformity in the Indian population is that of the various, you can see the load bearing going through. Even if the patient is asymptomatic, they tend to have various knees. And even if you 
put a poly on the high, on the medial side which is too tight the risk of progression to the lateral side is very less because inherently we have a various deformity and again is it a stop gap procedure if your patient asks you if you know i do this and after 10 years do i have to go to a total knee so it is not because it is if you see how a mechanical knee fails in a mechanical osteoarthritis the knee fails it's in a domino fashion it first fa fails in the medial compartment then the lateral and then the patellofemoral so if you stop the disease in the medial compartment by doing a ukr it is definitely not going to progress to the lateral compartment but again this is purely for mechanical osteoarthritis in the uh, you know inflammatory arthritis again the disease would start in all the compartments simultaneously so that's why uni is never considered in those kind of and now you know if people ask whether it's just a temporary procedure you can actually show these uh, results from price and swad they have 30 years follow up data of oxford knees with almost 90% survival which is equal to you know a total knee our series so i've just started doing it in 2019 i have about 84 cases so again looking at that number i'm just about around 24% of my total knees there and uh, my fellow is in the process of writing a paper down so uh, we can you know uniformly see shorter length of stay in the hospital the best part is the physiotherapy that is required is hardly anything patients get about and walk do all their things on their own you don't they don't need to be trained for much just the in hospital kind of physiotherapy is enough and then they return to of course adl is much better and the biggest part is so i don't do my unis just for the young patient group i do it for the elderly so the 80s the patients who come in so in these patients the complication rates are very very less so it is something that you can consider for some high risk patient of yours as well i hope this video runs here so this is the patient immediately post uh, surgery about 2 3 hours later is using a walker is moving about immediately this is the oh sorry the second one is yeah yeah so this is the next day yeah so the next day he's walking without any aid at all he doesn't this is the, the day of discharge so these patients are sent home within 24 hours we do something called as express Uh, knees, so they come on Saturdays and they go home on Sundays, just 24 hours. And this is once he reaches home, maybe after a week, I think he sends us this video. He's quite comfortably walking, almost off painkillers. And this is something that is not a criteria of us. You have to ride a scooter. He just did that and he sent it to us. So he, he I mean, it's just to show that he's that comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> and so the take home here is here i mean it's something that we need to consider it's got excellent outcomes especially in our population yeah totally accept that there's a learning curve you need to spend time attend their courses the oxford courses and then get a hang of it you have to reach that magical figure of 20% so you have to convert your total knee patients for uni compartmentals so that is something i mean they're not going to turn out of anywhere but it's your total needs that you have to take a share out of Uh, and once you do more you would get confidence and that confidence would translate into more patient willingness for surgery and uh, i would again mention that it's uh, definitely a viable option in majority of our medial compartmental low knees thank you so much questions regarding uni compartment dr sino yes sir as we know the uni compartmental knee the results are very good and excellent the satisfaction ra rate of total hip and total knee hmm. the patient forgets the total hip Absolutely. but does not forget the total knee some kind of discomfort always continues with the uni compartment compartmental knee the patient forgets that he has got a knee replacement yeah. Yeah. generally the problem is we are not thinking of uni compartmental knee where it is indicated where it is the only medial compartment intro medial osteoarthritis mm -hmm. and uh, the rest of the criteria you know the you, you showed the the cogens and scott so criteria yeah. about the 64% of the patient who were rejected they were rather fit for the oh, from the oxford criteria therefore one has to think about the has to be rather unique compartmental minded to do the unique compartment yeah. and one has to start yeah. then only you can uh, see the result That's so good. that is the point i wanted to make the excellent lecture thank given you. by you and the yeah. sci opener thank you thank you sir thank you sir so question 
uh, whether there is role of uh, MRI to be done before uh, being sure to of before offering the patient? Yeah, so I mm -hmm. did that in my initial kind of uh, unis. I did MRI, but see, patients about 50 or 60, if you do an MRI to assess the ACL, it is going to show you a signal and it is going to confuse you. So I think you should not do an MRI. The best thing is to go by the lateral standing. And to see the cartilage also? Cartilage, yeah, it's a visual kind of thing. So MRA is going to give you a lot of signals. A lot of things are going to blow up there. On the ACL, the cartilage defects are going to blow up. I mean, even if they're minor. So that really doesn't matter. So what it does is potentially it can create a problem for you in the future. In case something goes wrong, the patient can show you a record saying that, see, you, there was an MRA that showed some problem before and you still went ahead with it. So I would advise not to do an MRA. There's a laid down criteria for x-rays. I think stick to them and uh, they are they are pretty okay. It's proven. Oh. Thanks. Uh, nice talk, sir. Uh, my question is, ki what is your criteria of selecting a patient? If a patient comes to you with knee pain, mm -hmm. so what are the criteria according to you for selecting a patient as uni? Uh, the I think the most important thing is going to be the x-rays. I have to see bone-on-bone -bone disease on single compartment, that is the medial compartment. And on lateral, I need to see the posterior, uh, you know, it's a very specific kind of x-ray. You have to train your radio uh, people to get it done the right way. It is in flexion and weight bearing. So you can see if the, you know, posterior condyle is going beyond the tibial uh, plateau edge, that means you've lost cartilage. And you know for sure that even if the ACL is there, it's not functional. So those are two things. Along with that, then the standard UKR criteria of... Uh, you uh, take you stress know, x-rays and all. Yeah, the stress x-rays. MCLs. Yeah, yeah. That. Well but stress. more important for me is... But you lateral. check clinically also, sir? Sorry. Yeah, so that is what... I mean, then we come to, you know, your FFDs more than, you know, 15, 10 degrees or various, which is more than 15 degrees and not correctable. But if it is correcting, even 10 degrees, 12 degrees, I've done uni. And then, of course, you shouldn't touch the inflammatory knees and, uh, you know, uh, that, that's, I think, the mm -hmm. most important one. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Hi. Uh, my question is regarding the x-rays, uh, not the unicondyla one. Uh -huh. The x-rays in which uh, you said when the bone is not on the bone, you would never do a knee replacement. Uh, yeah, you will try yeah. it conservatively. But Correct. many a times, which I have seen, mm -hmm. that uh, the x-ray was showing a nice, a little gap or a little cartilage inside. Correct. But once you open the joint or put a scope inside, you see there's a huge cartilage yeah. defect at one place. But yeah. the x-ray, in spite of the x-ray being st a standing x-ray, uh, so many of the time after treating them conservatively for long and doing an arthroscopy, I suddenly realized I should have operated them. Do, have, have, you any, have you any such yeah, experiences? So these, these are the cases, like again, we started off with that, you know, about satisfaction and survival and which patients, where, you know, the basically when I do a total knee or whether I do a UKR, I want to be 100% sure that this patient does well. And so when you don't see this bone on bone kind of cartilage wear, so this is the kind of patient which I know is a lottery. I'll do a good surgery, 50, 60 percent of the time they might be okay, but there is a 30, 40 percent of chance that they might just come back with some residual pain. So again, uh, to, to continue with your point, if uh, you see those, there are special weight bearing X-rays that you can, you know, do to actually serve would know that, you know, inflection to look for exactly where the cartilage wear is, and uh, you know, see sometimes it's not dead distal kind of wear, so you wouldn't see the. A complete bone on bone on a standing. So you need to do a little bit of flexion and then do an anchor posterior view. And that would give you, you know, proper loss of cartilage. But at any point, if there is doubt, uh, I wouldn't, you know, as much as possible, but it happens like when we start our practice, we want to do more cases. I tended to do a lot of these kind of knees and yeah, that's why I used to see that uh, dissatisfaction levels being high. And, you know, over a period of time, as you assess your own work, you need to see that, you know, how you can better yourself. So this was one of the criteria, like avoiding bone-on-bone -bone kind of, uh, doing it in only purely bone-on-bone -bone has improved satisfaction levels. Yes, sir. If I would like to add to that, so yes, uh, the Oxford philosophy uh, does not believe in Cousin and Scrot criteria. Yep. That is only for fixed bearing unis. Uh, it is not op applicable to Oxfords at all. Uh, regarding then MRI, so Chris Dodd is very, uh, the designer for Oxford, he's very categorical. Don't do MRIs. Never do MRIs, otherwise you will never start doing unis. Because mm -hmm. cartilage is uh, not mappable on MRI. It is a very bad tool, uh, MRI for the cartilage. And second is you will always see ACL ganglion changes. So, uh, and uh, bone on bone is uh, definitely, it is the satisfaction score, sir. And uh, the New England registry actually demonstrated that bone on bone disease have longer survival after undergoing an uh, Oxford uni. Uh, but none of these applies for fixed bearing unis. Thank you. Yep. Very, very true, very true. Also, 
have to look for song like subacute osteonecrosis sometimes th that is a contraindication for uni you should not do unis but no no but i think uh, they work in fact it works very well in but sometimes patients have uh, f uh, you know dissatisfied after no but unis i think that is one of the indications i think you so have to do you know for a medial compartmental osteonecrosis i mean the uni is going to work magically you do it and the way the it takes away the pain uh, they would just walk out of your hospital the same day thank you thank you uh, now i would request uh, Dr. Mukherjee sir to please uh, present uh, my memento to Agra uh, Dr. H.S. Agrawal sir for his um, great, great uh, talk on uh, PG teaching basic uh, primary TKL. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would request Dr. Sunil Khemka sir to please uh, present a memento to Dr. Bhaskaran. Uh, I would request Dr. Tribhuvan Jain sir to please uh, present a memento to Dr. Gupta. Next, I would request Dr. Sunil Devangan, sir, to please present the memento to Dr. Pritam Agarwal for his excellent demonstration of the live surgery. Pritam. <laughs> Start. Uh -huh. Yes. And now we have just received word that we are ready at uh, Pune for the start of the demonstration of uh, robotic TKR. So we'll straight away uh, move to the live surgery. Hello. Hello, good afternoon. This is Dr. Nira Rasha from Pure, IT Hospital. Good afternoon, sir. This is Dr. Sinu here. Hi, sir. I'm good. I'm good. Uh, we are missing you here, but yeah, we can see you online. That is good enough. And uh, we are eagerly, everybody is eagerly waiting for your demonstration, sir. and tibia uh, and uh, we are ready for osteotomy now so uh, we are starting 
uh, meanwhile, any questions uh, from your side, I'll be happy to answer till the time we expose the joint. So what is the thickness so, of the spin you're using? Hello? Dr. Needers? Uh, yeah, yeah. We just lost you there for a minute. Uh, Dr. Preetam has a question for you, sir, regarding the tracker pins. So what is the thickness of the pin of the tracker that you're using? 4.5 millimeter. So have you found any problem with this pins later? And what place you uh, place this pin? Especially on the femoral side, uh, we had to actually uh, pass through top stitches and especially over the pins uh, like this. So, Have you ever used the pin through the, your incision of the proximal part of the incision? It will help in retracting the quadriceps. Sir, uh, we can use the pin through the proximal part of the incision, so it also helps in retracting the muscles. Uh, uh, Dr. Adkar, Dr. Sinu here. Uh, just uh, uh, so, have you done any of the initial pre TBL releases at this stage, or it's the robot that is going to guide us later based on balancing? Okay, sir.
Okay. So where we adjust our bone cut to minimize the soft tissue release. Okay. Uh, so please. So we are ready. Can can you just focus on one of the camera on the screen, please? Yes. On the screen, please. Okay. So we are. Doctor Shiro, we are starting with the registration process. Now. Yes, sir. We can see it beautifully. So this is a single point registration that you have done for all. Okay. 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 Yes. 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 Yes, sir, we can. So, uh, sir, uh, just to uh, stop you, the, the femur registration is complete now? Okay. Uh, just one doubt, sir. Uh, what about the hip center or it's not needed at all here? Okay. Okay. Okay, okay. Great, sir. Yes. Yes. 
Yeah, yeah, it looks all excellent to us, sir. So, uh, what are you doing right now, sir? You're trying to, okay. You're trying to do varus valgus or rotate? Uh, how are you trying? To? Okay. Yes, sir. So, left side of the screen top, uh, we have the current screen on 5 degrees of FFD now. And Correct. We need in around 7, 8 or 10 degrees of Aras. Yeah. And uh, it's roughly 5 on the medial side, 7 on the medial side, and 11 on the lateral side. Correct. So, uh, I am aiming for uh, 9 uh, poly here. So, okay. uh, we are going to uh, do some. Give some varus to the femur component here, like two degrees of varus. One more, please. Yes, femur shift up. We are increase, going to increase our distal uh, and back. Yeah, it looks, yeah, 10 on either side. Okay. Yeah. And you're okay with the virus in the femur, right? I mean, it's not yeah, much. Yeah. We can uh, rectify that. Femur about 2 degrees, 2 degrees, virus is acceptable. So, okay. combined virus around 4 to 5 degrees is uh, acceptable. Right, sir. Uh, some cases uh, it required with the virus and physical component as well, about a degree or 2 degrees. So, Sir, your, sir, there is a question. Yes, I just answered that. Uh, uh, this will uh, cut, reduce and increase the femur uh, by a Yes. So your femur cut is 10 mm on the medial side and 9.3 on lateral. And the tibial yes. cut is very yes. less. Down, down this and increase the tibia. Hmm. And tibia, yes, 1 mm down. Yes. Yeah, now it's better. Yes, sir. Right, sir. So that's the flexion, right, sir? Flexion is. You don't. Yeah, the rotation is okay, right? We don't need to change that. Yeah. Okay, sir. That pin is for uh, retraction, sir? Yes, that is for soft tissue retraction. Okay. This system will not allow slightest of the movement because it is fully automated. So, any movement uh, during retraction, it will stop. Okay, sir. So, all these things are for just soft tissue retraction. Apply, 
he entered the dance team which will attach patient's body to the robo. So this team is just about the epicondyle. So that's the epicondyle. I'm just about it. Uh, we insert that. Uh, we just uh, take out the tissue spine because that comes in between uh, the while taking the posterior lateral cut. Uh, This pin is holding the extensor mechanism there, or uh, this this pin is holding the extensor mechanism, or just retracting? No, no, it is not for <coughs> extensor purpose. It's to hold the, the robo. robo. Okay, okay. Okay. So we are operating without two rigs. Still good skills. And uh, so as you can see in that screen, uh, the yellow array is for tibia and green is for femur, magenta is for robo. So yellow and uh, green, table of leaves, should be in the, that, those circles, top view and side view. If those two are in acceptable zone, then only it will uh, eliminate or move. Can you just get table down slightly? So here we check before we start. Yes, check. Okay. Now, if you again, I ask you to identify those points on the femur. Just to confirm that everything is in place. Yes, please. Yes, please. Uh, sir, can we see the main screen? Yeah, thanks, thanks. Yes, yes. Is the uh, cutting process of this robo, can you see that? Yes, sir, we can see that. So this is a milling kind of device, right? Yeah, Miller. Miller. So now we have started the distal femoral cut. As you can see on that screen, the medial side, it is on 9.7 resection. Lateral side, 8.3 resection we have planned. So, so it auto stops when it goes into soft tissue or? Uh it stops and uh, with neurotic bone, it will stop. Okay. It stops and it will stop. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 
So, sir, how you cut this sclerotic bone? Freehand, you will do that. Uh, sir, just a question about uh, the robo. This QVIS system, they call it as a completely automatic robo. So, uh, uh, what is the difference between this and the other, uh, you know, semi automatic systems? Okay, sir. Okay, yeah, totally understand, sir. Thank you. 
plant. It works uh, on its own and uh, saves a lot of time. Yes. Uh, is there a cross check mechanism once the cut is done? Uh, like, yes, or it is there. And uh, I mean, uh, I've been mean asked this question many times that cross check or uh, do we need to validate our cut? But what happens? Uh, can you just even ask the phone? Okay, start please. So once the resection is complete, we can do the cross check. Okay, sir. Now we are proceeding with the anterior cut. Sir, you are doing a CR knee or PS? PS, PS knee. Okay, so the notch cut. जो बॉक्स कटी आल्सो थ्रू द रोबोट ओनली और मैनुअल ओके व्हाट अबाउट पटेला Uh, 
posterior lateral cut, uh, the tibial spine sometimes just uh, pokes or you know it comes in between. So that's why we just shave it off uh, before we start the resection. Done under as you can see, this is done under continuous uh, saline uh, irrigation and uh, we mix uh, gentamicin in this saline. Uh, so, can you just resume please? My staff is happy with this system because there is less traffic for them. So uh, after this, uh, it will proceed with the lung holes, as you can see. And slightly of the bone movement, it is going to stop. That's why those retraction pins and other dance pins are necessary to avoid any movement. the box cut after this the thin trapezoidal cut is also prepared and you can see can you just zoom it through there can you just zoom it okay so thin trapezoidal cut is also prepared small of millimeter of millimeter procedure okay so this is basically a complete uh, femoral resection uh, so can we have the uh, the uh, the main screen on as the larger screen and the, uh, the okay. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Sir. So, before we start the tibial dissection, uh, we take out the posterior condyle because it uh, sometimes obstructs the path of the miller. So, which part of the what uh, posterior condyle? What are you knocking out right now? Okay. And the cut is complete. So that loose fibre we just take it out because then it obstructs the path of the miller by taking the tibial cut. Okay. Here again, you can ask uh, me to identify this point just to confirm that the situation between the array and the CBI is not changed. Yes, so it's good. And uh, can you just click on this side, please? Can you just please? Okay, can you just please? Yes. Yes. So now we are ready to go. And it will start the uh, visual detection. Uh, you don't need to put in a central spike or a posterior okay, spike? So we don't need to supplement the CBI here. Okay. And while doing the CT planning, what we do once the slow everything is adjusted on CT, we just shift the CBI base by 2 or 3 millimeter in front. Uh, so as such, it shifts uh, around uh, 3 4 millimeter of bony boundary intact on the medial, lateral, and posterior side. Uh, uh, but by 
I doing this? Uh, uh, just Shankar and secondly, I want to introduce the best question. Also, uh, here in this meeting, you have option of uh, field preparation, uh, but uh, uh, we are not doing that. We just uh, go ahead with the PDF cut and uh, getting PDF preparation we do on our own. So now, medial side resection is complete. As you can see on the screen, it is around 4.1 on the medial side and 6.7 on the lateral side. So try to keep this uh, cut to minimum. And if required, it can be, we can increase uh, the cut later on. So based on, but based on our uh, previous, uh, our uh, pre resection gas take, here we are aiming for 9 mm poly. So this lateral resection, as you can see, the system goes medial and from medial to lateral it will uh, go inside. Uh, just to be on the safer side, we describe the particular tender. But it's, uh, as you can see on that screen, the yellow marking is the boundary for the robo. Beyond which it will never go. <laughs> in fact, it stays within that boundary at six to three millimeters on each side. If you need to nibble out or uh, take out with the help of a saw. So this essentially completes our uh, home cut. What we will do now, we will detach the robo from the station body and then uh, we will keep the array intact and uh, we will nibble out the extension board and we will go and the side implant. So, Yes, sir. There is a question about the CT planning. Uh, who does the CT planning and how long it take? Sorry? The, about the CT planning before surgery. Once you get the CT scan done, how long it take? You can take the patient to the OT. Sir, am I audible? How long it take to, after CT scan, you can take the patient to the OT? Like next day, if you do a CT scan today, yeah. and you can plan and take the patient to the OT next day? Yeah. And, and who, do, who does this planning? Okay, sir. So, at this stage, we just take out the DMIO leg holder and we go uh, ahead uh, with our conventional uh, side support and uh, the L support, which we use all of us. <laughs> while doing TTR. So it actually saves a lot of time uh, for you later on. And uh, so this uh, leg holder is a prerequisite. It is compulsory. We need to. Okay. Can you, uh, can you just put the uh, can, you, can you just focus on this? Uh, uh, can you just focus put the support there? Yeah, we can see that now, sir. Okay, sir. And, uh, so it really helps you to keep the leg steady while uh, doing the detection. Right, sir. Okay. So back to our operation. 
So you do the keel now or you do a floating trial and then finalize it? So can the robotic arm be tilted in a way to take off the posterior osteophytes or it's too dangerous? Yeah, we can't just go and have a cup of coffee, <laughs> leave it there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so there's one question from the audience. Just. Uh, hello, yeah. Yeah, Dr. Atkar. Yeah, there is one question. Uh, I'm Dr. Ankur Singhal from Raipur. I just want to ask, since you are using so many pins, uh, in your practice, uh, have you found any uh, stress fractures, especially in obese, short, stout females with small size femur or tibia? Do you put bone grafts also on the, over the holes just to be, you know?
Sir, what about surgical time? It has increased after no, using. Uh, sir, did you find any uh, post-op pain less as compared to the conventional technique or it is the same? Like any difference in the post-op pain? So any reason for that with the robo range of movement increasing or it's an observation till now? So can we do this cut with robo? This. Okay. Rotation we can uh, adjust with the robo.
trials? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Very nice. Can we see the screen, sir, the computer screen to look at or uh, it zoomed out. Can we see it a bit closer? I mean Yeah, better, better, sir. We can have a close up on that. Yeah. Yes, sir. We can see now. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice, sir. Very good. Right, sir. And, okay, looks good. I'm not able to pull it out easily. Correct. Are you happy with this? Yes, sir. Very nice, sir. Okay. So, uh, that is from our side. So, what we think is uh, 9 and a calling is absolutely stable. I'm happy with this. Uh, I complete correction of FMD and virus. And uh, we are good to go for cementing now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. It was. I thank the organizers for involving me and Maxwell uh, in this uh, prestigious conference. And uh, I thank my Anastasia uh, team, uh, Dr. Pare, and uh, her associates for working on Sunday, Dr. Girish. Uh, my uh, colleague, uh, actually, it's really, it's really his birthday, but he's celebrating today. Wow. Here. Happy birthday from all of us here. <laughs> Tell him that. Yeah, let it hi, yeah. hi. Thank you, thank you so much, sir. Thank you, and uh, from Kemka, sir, and rest of all of us here, thank you so much for a wonderful, wonderful demonstration, as usual, sir. Thank you. Bye, bye, bye sir. Okay. After a wonderful demonstration of uh, robotic surgery, I would like to invite Dr. Ankur Singhal for his talk on TKR in valgus knee bilateral parapatellar approach.
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak on this uh, topic. So, vulgus needs itself is a challenge to balance. So, I am uh, depicting here lateral parapet approach for severe vulgus knees. So, the incidence of vulgus is usually 10% uh, out of the total arthritic knees. Uh, slightly, I'll go brief in uh, for the pathonotomy as it is already explained by Dr. Gupta. So, there is a deformity in the femoral condyle distally and posteriorly. Contracted structures are usually popliteal fibular ligament, lateral collateral ligaments, postlateral capsules, LCL, ITI band, and lastly, popliteal tendon. Patella mild tracking is commonly seen in such cases because of increased Q angle, excessive tibial torsion, and tight lateral reticulum. So, classification the two classifications primarily Ranawath classification that is mild 10, less than 10 degrees, moderate 10 to 20, and severe is more than 20. And there is one other functional classification which is the Mollagi classification in which grade 1 is uh, correctable valgus with intact MCL. Grade 2 is rigid with intact MCL. Grade 3 is valgus with recurvatum. 4 is with de flexion deformity. Grade 5 is valgus with incomplete MCL. And grade 6 with extraarticular deformity. So how do we balance the valgus knees? If it is the f extension is tight, then we have to release IT band and post lateral capsule. If structures uh, structures which are taught in flexion extension are LCN and popliteal tendon, and structures which are taught only in flexion is popliteal fibular ligament. So in while balancing in uh, the knee in extension, release IT band by pie casting technique with 11 number blade. Sometimes posterior capsule release also required, which is done by Ranawat's technique, inside out method. And if it is still not corrected in extension, then we can do a little epicondylar osteotomy. So uh, balancing inflection, we do by releasing popliteal fibular ligament, uh, LCL, and lastly, popliteal tendon. The popliteal tendon is the last to, rele to be released in cases of flexion uh, imbalance. So uh, Mark case presentation, she's a 52-year-old female with bilateral knee valgus deformity. Uh, her height was small, uh, 142 centimeters, and weighed 37 kgs. She was a non-rheumatoid lady. Uh, she used to walk with sticks since last three years. So what are the clinical features? She had valgus deformity of approximately 30 degrees, and it was rigid, recurvatum of 5 degrees in both knees. Uh, I have examined hip and spine also, which should be done routinely. So this was the pre-op x-rays. Uh, the scanogram shows around 30 to th uh, 30 degrees valgus more uh, in both knees. So this was the video. Uh, this is the deformity. So what are the challenges in such knees? Uh, severe rigid valgus is there, recurvatum of 5 degrees, small bones, chances of iatrogenic factors are very high, bones are osteopathic. We have to maintain a proper patella tracking with maintaining the patellofemoral biomechanics. So what are the merits in such cases of lateral parapatella approach? It's a direct approach, provides extensive lateral release with good exposure. It internally rotates the tibia. So we have a improved access to the postlateral corners, allows better titration and sequential release with accurate flexion extension balancing. Since we are doing lateral approach, so it preserves the vascularity as most of the vessels are on the medial side centralizes the quadriceps patella mechanism and optimizes the tracking and it definitely improves the femoral tibial stability. The demerits of medial approach in such cases are it's an indirect approach. When we do a medial parapetellar, we have to extrorotate the tibia. So postlateral corner is difficult. Vascularity is definitely decreased as compared to the lateral approach. It does not allow for correction of external rotation contractures of tibia. Patellar mal tracking are more common with medial approach in such cases. Increased chances of inaccurate flexion extension balancing and less than optimal femoral stability. So these are the papers in which let, uh, of lateral parapet approach. Now the surgical steps. Uh, we take anterior midline incision centered over the lateral one third of patella, lateral to the tibial tubercle. Uh, lateral reticulum, lateral to the lateral margins of patella are incised up to three to seven centimeters. We have to undermine the soft tissues and we have to separate the superficial part with the deep part, that is lateral reticulum and deep capsule complexes are separated in two layers. Inferior portion, including the infrapatellar fat pad and portion of lateral meniscus are spared, and IT band are released at the girdis tubercle along with the anterior portion of the capsule. So first, always remember, if you, do, you are doing a TKR, don't do, go ex, uh, exclusively for releases. First, remove the osteophytes. Femur cut is usually done on the basis of pre-op scanograms. In valgus knees, usually we keep three to four degree of valgus. Tibia cut perpendicular to the mechanical axis. In case of tibial or femoral defects, try to cut less bone 
to accommodate the minimum poly always remember there are chances of nerve neuropraxia if you accommodate more polys in valgus knees rotation assessment done by trans epicondylar axis tibia cut and white size line pie crusting of the it band if the extension is tight or trapezoidal gap is there sometimes we require posterior capsule release that is by inside out technique so this was the post op x ray of the same patient uh, we achieved a neutral alignment so this is the post op video uh, it was it is around 1 and 1/2 months down the line so there is one uh, yeah this is the correction which we achieved after surgery so this one small surgical video demonstrating the lateral parapetal approach so soft tissue dissected and I, I usually mark my incision uh, in such cases uh, always use patella tendon pins to avoid avulsions of the patella tendon yeah so i am the soft tissue is totally dissected so this is a marking the incision if you are dealing with a stiff knee you can also do quadriceps snip with lateral parapetal approach so always remember uh, try to preserve as much inferior patella uh, patella fat pad so that you can use it later on for closure so we go a bit fast yeah so now the arthrotomy is being done so now now i'm releasing the lateral structures it band to the gardis tubercle so the beauty of this approach is the exposure is good and definitely you can release the lateral structures and balancing is better because i have found in many valgus cases when you do a medial parapetal approach still there is valgus you don't get a neutral alignment which is you can accurate balancing is there in case of lateral parapetal approach so i am further raising the posterior part of the lateral capsule as well so most of the release is done with exposure now this is the complete 
tibia femur which is visualized. So we, I have kept a, a valgus of 4 degrees. This I am taking distal femur cuts. So always take minimal cuts so that definitely you can revise it if required. Don't go for too much higher cuts in such cases. So around 5 to 6 millimeter of medial cut was there. Since there was no cut on the lateral side, I have done a plus 2. So at least a 2 millimeter cut was there on the lateral side. So after doing the cuts, I did the tibia cut. So lateral part is medially 7 millimeter of bone was cut and laterally few millimeters were cut. Yeah. Small defect was there which was managed with bone cement. So once the cut was taken, now I am checking for the extension gap which was tight laterally. So I did uh, IT band pie crusting with 50 number blade and uh, release was done of the posterior capsule and once I did it the extension gap was balanced and for flexion I have to mark all the three lines and according to that I did my rotation. So don't rely on the posterior condyles in case of lateral knees, lateral valgus knees. So once I was happy with the cuts and the balance extension balancing, yeah, I am here I am checking the TBL alignment. So yeah, this was the rotation which I was yeah, I marked epicondral axis and then uh, I put the zig according to that. So this is the flexion balance I am checking. Yeah, so it is completely balanced. Yeah, this is the extension alignment being checked. Yeah, so the knee is completely balanced both in flexion and extension. So this is I am giving cocktail. So yeah, this is the approach. So in summary, uh, lateral parapatal approach is a better approach in severe valgus deformities. Accurate flexion extension balancing is done with better patella tracking. Uh, removed osteophytes, bone cuts to be taken as per pre-op planning. Release the tight structures in a sequential manner. Balance flexion extension. Closure is very important in such cases and uh, to be done meticulously with a preserved fat pad. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ankur. If uh, there are any questions from Dr. Ankur. Very nice, Ankur. The lateral parapatellar approach, Kiblish approach, is very less popularized. Surgeons are very scared to do it. But whenever there is a severe valgus, the two most important advantages, immediately you release the IT band, number yes. one. And second, you improve the patellar tracking by lateral release, which is most often required in the medial parapatellar approach. And the closure is never a problem if you do the never. chest plasty. So that yes, is very yes, nice yes. approach and we should learn it Definitely. very well. And even I feel patients who have even 15, 20 degree valgus, we, we tend to do a medial parapatellar approach, but it accelerates the TBR. So we have we, some part of MCL is still released and we are we are sure that we have done the balancing, but still there is valgus left in it. And post of you might see there is still valgus is there, especially even if you are not doing a lateral parapet. So try to reach lateral parapet approach, closure is not a problem if done meticulously. That is what I feel. And I am, nowadays I am doing most of the valgus knees with lateral parapetal approach. After doing median in so many cases. Thank you, Dr. Ankur. Uh, now I would request Dr. Pritam Agarwal to present the memento and certificate to uh, Dr. Ankur Singhal, please.
Uh, I would also request Dr. Pita Magarwal to present the memento uh, on behalf of Dr. Neera Jatkar to uh, Mr. Kandar from the Merrill team. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll have a lunch break now and we continue with the scientific sessions after the lunch break. Hello, 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 hello. Hello, my check one. Hello, check. Hello, check. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Hello, 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 check. Hello, hello, check one. Hello, 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 check. Hello, hello, check one.
चेक करो तो ठीक है देख तू दबा तू तू
पहले ही सर आपको सर मैं समझ गया था बिल्कुल सर
नहीं वाले हैं वाले सो नाउ वी आर रेडी टू स्टार्ट आर पोस्ट लंच सेशन वी हैव अ टोटल ऑफ एट टॉक्स फ्रॉम डिफरेंट स्पीकर्स इन दिस एंड वी आर गोइंग टू कवर अ लॉट ऑफ वाइड रेंज ऑफ टॉपिक्स नाउ फॉर द फर्स्ट स्पीकर आई वुड लाइक टू इन्वाइट डॉक्टर सुनील देवांगन सर फॉर हिज बोन कट्स इन प्राइमरी टी केयर I like to invite Dr. D. Sunil for his talk. <laughs> Hello. First of all, thanks the organizer and specifically this is an honor and privilege that I am the first time Mukherjee sir to present in front of you. I am getting a PG feeling in front of me. But I am very confident that I am very confident that I am not going to do this wrong. अभी तक हमने देखा कि वी आर हैव डन अ लॉट इन रोबोटिक्स एंड नेविगेशन एंड कॉम्प्लिकेटेड केसेस एंड एवरीथिंग दिस टॉक इज एक्सक्लूसिवली मेड फॉर अ बिगिनर सो दोज हु आर स्टार्टिंग अगेन मोस्ट ऑफ द पीपल ओवर हियर आर डूइंग ऑलमोस्ट लेट से फाइव टेन केसेस सो अगेन वी आर गोइंग टू द बेसिक सो बोन कट्स इन द वेरी बेसिक प्राइमरी टी केयर वाई वी आर डिस्कसिंग हियर बिकॉज एवरी वन मस्ट गेस्ट द एक्सपर्ट इज ऑन कन्वेंशनल टेक्निक बिकॉज we have seen in even in the robotics we need some kind of a conventional removal of osteophyte and balancing by your own so the limiting factor is feasibility and the cost of the robotics and navigation basic planning is must including the perioperative full planning information of total your technical staff and explaining them the detailed history and examination a day before position yourself on ot table patient positioning is very important and check all itineraries by yourself for your knowledge what is missing so i do simply this conventional technical lateral post and the foot post by this we can adjust the limb very comfortably we don't need an extra cost for any other thing the standard approach is midlines medial parapetellar approach once you expose the knee you need to remove all debulking of the tissue starting from fat pad synovium and finally all the osteophytes why i am telling you because if you remove all the osteophytes you are actually creating a normal anatomy to the knees and once you prepared normal anatomy you are creating the bony anatomy you have your bone cuts are very easy and you can do very nice balancing you don't need anything then so actually while going to what to release medial what to release lateral nothing you simply try to restore the normal bony structure anatomy apart from the worn out surface then you are totally safe dislocation of the tibia is very important for beginner it's very difficult and sometime it i have seen means i myself i struggle initially it dislocate nahi hoga to main kaise operate karunga kya karunga so dislocation of the tibia is the key and for that what you need is a medial sleeve dissection for a standard varus case if you do a proper debulking of osteophytes medial removal of osteophytes and then you do what i do name it as a spiral release start from the posterior medial corner superiorly and inferiorly come to the enteromedial medial point and once you do this your knee is almost balanced you hardly need in a uh, fine tuning at the end of your balancing so this kind of a prepare, bed preparation if you have done for your tkr i think your job job is done and i your assistant can finish the job over here so do this one remove all the Uh, removable things means menisci and acl pcl and check in toto they have removed it not try to remove it the last ki piche phasa hua hai usko main baad mein nikalunga bilkul nahi shuru mein aap nikal lo and do finally go for a preparation of a bone bed so now actually we are coming to the bone steps so must always start with a sharp new blade कंपनी वाले देके जो जाते हैं दैट इज़ वेरी डिफिकल्ट वो सौ चलेगा नहीं तुमको एक्स्ट्रा कॉस्ट लगेगा एंड वंस यू आर पुट पुलिंग इन साइड it's your pressurizing you are not cutting it freely so coming to the basic cuts now seven cuts essential five in the femur one in the tibia and patella of course notch so most important bone cut is definitely tibia because it affects both flexion and extension gap 
so tibia is prepared in a two part so cut the tibia first why i am telling you tibia cut first because on sizing posterior flange of the femoral sizer may not provide a free space and thus can result a wrong sizing of the femur this is very important because if you are not able to flush those flanges to the posterior condyle it will lift it off and mal sizing is possible in the femur so tbl side preparation first you definitely do not want to cut more than 8 to 10 mm if doubt you cut from the top start cutting from the top and then you can cut from the slot so you don't need to adjust again and again in a 2 mm slot over here and we might need a repositioning later on if you have already gone through the cut surface so never mind if you are recutting the tibia so put all these things and this is very important keep the limb vertical so your orientation is very nice and these alignment jigs are very helpful platform has very essential because we have seen in a even demonstration case if you remove all this platform this small part is very you know uh, movable and it is not providing a proper stability while cutting so your posterior slope control is lost there positioning again here that antero posteriorly has to be on the midline and that is very important and it has to be flush to the anterior cortex so push it ask your assistant to push and make it flush to the anterior cortex because if it is not flushing to that in that case your slope will be wrong means you may go more on the thickness if you are calculating a 9 mm or 8 mm tibia and your cut will be actually more than if you are not flushing this so some problem definitely may arise cutting too much of tibia that you, you have to keep in mind so bone stock be becomes weaker and more osteoporotic bone on the tbl side if it is a smaller then it will sink so cutting so far down you never try to reach up to at least fibular head if you are feeling it definitely have gone to more cut so always target it to 8 or maximum 10 mm of plastic so rotation is also important so with the alignment jig it has to be midline antero posterior rotation slot of the tbl base plate trial should be placed on the center of the tbl tuberosity that is in the final preparation but while cutting it if your translation of the jig what you are applying on to the malleoli medial lateral translation should not be there because if you are translating it so either you are cutting at posterior medially or laterally so in both the cases your balancing is not going to support so this thing what i am telling you if you are translating it medial or laterally your cut will be also in the upper side will be deviated opposite side so this should be the ideal position try make it perpendicular and follow this picture and you will be on the safer side check it whether you have done a wrong, right thing in a varus case thin this side is thick next coming to the femoral entry point i have seen many surgeons no one is bothering about the most dreaded complication of fat embolism in the tkr i have seen one cases very simple showering on table patient not collapse but sudden bp drop what, what it happens when you are using this one directly you are drilling through the central point and comp company people will ask so do it do it nothing will happen so my criteria is simple start with a 3.5 drill bit start with a small goose second third 5 mm of osteotome you just rotate in open the hole clearly and then 16 mm catheter you have to insert fully inside suck all the fat and then you insert your rod because then pressure is totally off at least you have sucked out the fat so that is the safest because then you are only don't do this suddenly it is a gradual and it's not allowing a proper pressure uh, depressurization so embolization is the at a high at highest risk then everything is a standard if whatever your company says 5 degrees 3 degrees that you calculate definitely no but assembly of the jig is a very important because this part when you start hammering here on the sclerotic bone part it will come out either it will open a split fracture is possible so i always used to drill it first that point where you are putting the, your nails you first drill it and then put your nails otherwise there are self tapping screws person they are providing in some they directly give you the pin and ask you to hammer don't do that because i have found if it is a splitting then you are at a problem 
so this assembly should be finally made in a such a manner while drilling the bone to the specific point always check your cut before doing the final cut and you zoom out yourself by just going back to the femur side and you check whether actually it is showing it as a valgus appearance or not you can check it your appearance will provide you that this is a valgus cut and then you go ahead because sometime it happens and most of the cases when you are free ek bar kabhi aap varus mein the femur cut kar diye that is a problem so always check it again this is standard cut once you do this so now your extension gap is ready when doing to the sizing even with the experienced surgeon notching of anterior cortex is already concern it's very embarrassing while showing the x ray you know it and your colleague knows yaar ye notching kar diya isne so notching of anterior cortex may lead to definitely later on intraoperative or pre uh, post op periprosthetic fractures while doing a sizing that is important because if you follow the cortex so the lateral cortical ridge is very critical and important you follow that you are never going to notch because if you simply uh, drop down your stylus from lateral to medial side it, it will be notching because the paper shows if more than 25% of cortex is compromised your chances of fractures are increasing constantly so overstuffing is also a dangerous part but i would say notching is more dangerous than overstuffing so do this so what i was talking about when you you have not taken tibia first this will not allow you the space to enter so this will finally lift off and finally you will not be exactly getting this size of what what is exactly size of the femur so do this and follow then proper at the same time if you have already done the release what i have shown in that you can actually check on this that your flexion gap is rectangular here by your external rotation and everything you can have a judgment you don't need to actually measure what i have noticed that uh, pritham has not checked flexion gap just because of experience he said okay i am comfortable and i am moving and that feel you will get finally so two problem could arise with a conventional order order of cutting is very important because normally what happens we do cut first anterior then posterior and then chamfer so there are problem why it happens because once you are cutting on the anterior part and mostly people enter through the medial cortical side which is sclerotic medial condylar and you start pushing your saw it that is not free moving saw and once you are pushing it your jig is going to be tilted and once you are tilting it definitely there is a possibility of anterior cortical notching is there so don't do that do a free moving and that free moving oscillation saw is only possible when your saw is very sharp and easily cutting so whenever there is a metallic sound or pressurization just stop there and think this is something wrong so better sequence i would say go first posteriorly then chamfers and then finally you anterior cut because even most surgeons i have seen they are not exposing the supracondylar zone and they are not uh, stripping the peri of ostium for your anterior cortical things because they are comfortable i am confident at one point you will find okay there is a notching so do it stripping of 2 cm of peri ostium is very nice for at least to be on safer side of not notching it so once you finish off your all five cuts then comes to the notch what i do is in this center part i mark it first vertically so there are these two, two condyles have been divided in two part and then marking with the central point i normally place our notch to the left side so you are literally biased and finally that will help you in a padlet padlet tracking always use a smaller blade which is very neglected blade always wo aapko 6 bar 8 bar 10 bar use karne ke baad hi pakdayega fresh notching blade nahi pakdayega kabhi so that is very important so t <coughs> next coming to the tbl base plate preparation it should sit very nicely to the center on the top you can check the butterfly shape of the tibia that should be symmetrical from the top if not centrally located then definitely the mal rotation is corrected this tracking you have to finally before means uh, flexion and extension gap you actually do with a trial and you can check it whether it is centrally located and but while preparing the tibia because i am uh, escaping the central steps which you are doing through the tracking so what is the position of your tibial tray is 
anterior cortex and lateral cortex should follow and rest of the thing you can debulk so final setting should be ideally is this but sometime because of osteophytes and everything you get confused you are not actually uh, making the lateral and anterior to the cortical margin so base plate should sit anterior cortex and removing after removing the oste osteophytes that's what you are following the exactly where the uh, your tbl track is ge getting rotated automatically while trial with the femur so this is the final position you prepare your keel and once your preparation is ready then you can go for central keel preparation pulse lavage definitely i would prefer because that gives you a very good bone bed and cementing bondation is very nicely i think that uh, our conventional so called syringe based pulse lavage is ne never going to provide you the proper cementing so if you are doing a 1.5 lakh uh, cost for patient this is hardly 5 to 7000 you have to definitely use this digital pressurization of cement is also very important because that part what i do feel that once you put it pressurized digitally and then finally with the implant pushing never 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 hammer hammer is never used in the cementing it's a simple simple pressurization only once you pressurize this and if it in a proper liquid state working state it never provides you too much of resistance so cement preparation is very important i do keep my cement specifically in a deep freezer and then just before the surgery i ask them to keep in a normal door of the freezer and that provides you almost like 11 and 13 minute working time so in a proper liquid state you have a almost 3 minutes to 8 minute of window margin to create proper cementing and good implantation so this simple pressurization is important you never need to bang on this i am an all poly lover definitely so this is very good for cost also and there are a lot of factors once you do your femoral tibia well implanted then comes to the patella tracking so the important point is definitely ensure not to oversize indian patella is not beyond 21 to 22 millimeter and the last possible size for the patella replacement is 8 millimeter I have done a study personally in India, not published, but seen that most of the patella are almost 18 millimeter to 90, uh, 21 millimeter thickness. And if you are uh, replacing, so beyond 16 minute of uh, 16 mm of residual patella, it's very dangerous for you to get a uh, not not getting a patellar complication. Ensure a flat cut and definitely lateralization is important. I do simply patelloplasty remove 2-3 millimeter of cartilage and it's debulk also and do not need a lateral release if at all needed you can do a lateral release definitely so these are very basic to get a very nice result once you do meticulous clearance of everything your natural anatomy is restored and what we are trying and finally get a very good range of motion also so the maximum bone preservation and proper soft tissue balance is the aim to achieve better results, patient satisfaction and less revision rate. My take home message is definitely joint replacement gives a very good results. It's a highly demanding procedure. Training for a longer period is a very important. Besides surgical skills, your logistics and operating conditions are very important. Lot of patience is required for procedure and follow up also. Thank you for your patient listening. Thank you, Dr. Disrail. Uh, if there are any queries, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Ankur Gupta uh, for his talk.
good afternoon everyone uh, i would be speaking on the flexion deformities and uh, this is a small practical guide how do we manage flexion deformities in knee replacement so the basic pathology in flexion deformity is the posterior femoral and tibial osteophytes the main pathology is posteriorly the posterior capsule contracture the ligament contractures the hamstring tightness and the intercondylar osteophytes sometimes they cause mechanical bone block so how to plan first we need to grade the deformity grading the deformity is a difficult job because at times on the operating uh, on your examination table you you may find that uh, like this deformity it seems it is more than 45 degrees but moment you give anesthesia to this this lady the deformity comes back to 25 to 20 degrees so actually you uh, you can't plan it on your uh, uh, examining table but you plan it directly in the ot you decide how much is the flexion deformity so the grade will change uh, pre anesthesia and post anesthesia the cuts you may, you uh, may need extra cuts or may not need extra cuts the releases which is po basically posteriorly rotation of the implant sometimes they may be a posterior condylar defect and in that cases the uh, rotation of the implant has to be taken care of the tibial slope and the implant size which which needs to be uh, changed in some cases so uh, when it comes to grades the same lady when we put in uh, put her in anesthesia the flexion deformity decreases and it it, it is only to, uh, now 20 degrees so the grade is less than 15 degrees 15 to 30 degrees and more than 30 degrees a uh, uh, wonderful lecture was given by dr sunil uh, so these are the basic cuts in flexion deformity we tend to keep the cuts almost the same the only step that changes is a transverse distal femur cut which is also not always done so for any knee to function the most important is to have a rectangular flexion and extension gap in this case also the main aim is to keep a rectangular flexion and extension gap and the, uh, we have in many series in many lectures we have seen these four situations in flexion deformities we pre plan that we are going to get a, a tibia these these pictures are after the cuts after the cuts there, there may be a tight flexion extension gap there may be a um, a, a loose extension and flexion gap but in a flexion deformity even after normal cuts you might get a situation in which the extension gap is less and the the, the flexion gap is more so how do we plan it so the distal femoral cut the distal femoral cut in grade 1 and 2 should be standard and in grade 3 you might need an extra 2 mm or you may uh, you may release up to 4 mm of cut and even after doing a 4 mm sometimes in severe deformity you might get a picture like this in this case i have i've done only a 2 mm extra cut still there is no gap need not worry need not recut the tibia once once you are very sure that you have cut an 8 mm tibia just wait posterior release might increase your extension gap so next thing is upsizing of the femoral implant an upsizing of femoral implant will decrease the flexion gap so in case when you measure uh, the measurement comes between two sizes try to go for an upsize because later on you can always downsize it but an upsize will decrease the flexion gap so in case after release you find that the flexion gap is still more uh, you, you can take some extra tibial cuts and uh, with a larger uh, femoral implant you can balance the knee next thing at times you may find a condylar defect don't rely on the 3 degree jig which is provided to you by the company people in this case i had to go for an extra 11 mm of external rotation to get a proper tri transcondylar axis so always check your transcondylar axis especially in cases where there's a defect in the posterior condyle now the posterior release starts first with an osteophyte you release all the osteophytes which are uh, posteriorly slowly release of the posterior recess is done and after that you again recheck after releasing your uh, after after releasing your pcl and all the posterior structures if there is still the extension gap is less then then either go for a gastrocnemius release or we we can uh, go for another 2 mm distal cut so the distal cut can be done two times 2 mm and 2 mm maximum 4 mm 
and uh, medial and lateral hamstrings are very rarely, I have never done a case in which I had to do a hamstring release. The posterior slope, normally, the commonly we, we take a slope of 0 to 5 degree, but whenever there is a uh, flexion deformity, a posterior slope will increase the, the flexion gap. So try to be absolutely neutral, no, uh, no posterior slope in uh, severe flexion deformities. So, so this, is a, this is a case. Post-op, there was a flexion deformity, and uh, it has been released. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ankur. Thank you. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Anshur Shekhar for his talk now. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I would like to first thank uh, Khemka sir and uh, Dr. Pritam for giving me this opportunity to speak. So uh, my topic here basically is a summary of what we have been hearing throughout the day, uh, which is about balancing uh, total knee arthroplasty. Now, we all love Christian Bale in The Machinist and in American Hustle, but when we want to be like him, we want to be the Batman. That is how we want our TKRs to be. We want them in the perfect shape and balance. Now, there are some caveats which apply. The first caveat is that there is no definition of a balanced total knee replacement. There is nothing like there should be a medial opening of one millimeter which is universally accepted or there should be a four millimeter op opening on the lateral side which is universally accepted. So this varies surgeon to surgeon, institution to institution. As yet, nobody believes what uh, the other person says. And the second caveat is that the native knee is not symmetrical. The native knee is not symmetrical. We are trying to get balanced gaps that is balanced gaps, symmetrical on the medial and lateral side using implants after resecting God-given ligaments, which itself is a fallacy. So uh, with these limitations, we need to balance the knee in a way, not just in flexion and extension, but also medially laterally and the patellofemoral joint as well. So we need to get all these three alignments, uh, rather balances correct. So balancing, basically, the philosophy of balancing is like religion. You know, each one believes that their God is the greatest and their God is the only God and there is no other God. Just like that, we have the measured resection technique, people who believe and swear by the measured resection. There are people who believe and swear by the gap balancing technique. And now we have this new religion, which claims that it is the best and, you know, it's going to solve all problems. Now, uh, personally, uh, this, is, this, this has been a subject of study and uh, I got this published in the Journal of Arthroplasty. We performed, this was a randomized uh, control study of simultaneous bilateral TKs. Now these were randomized. One knee was randomized to a uh, gap balancing and what the other knee was randomized to a uh, measured resection technique. We measured all the bones that were resected. The thickness was measured using vernier calipers. And uh, two years follow-up of range of motion, radiological assessment, and uh, revised Oxford knee score was performed. Now, this was the device which was used for uh, the gap balancing. This is the ProFlex G from Biomet. This is an anterior, ref anterior referenced flexion gap balancing only. The extension gap was not balanced uh, by this technique. What we found at the end of two years was that there is no difference in the knees which underwent either a MR or a GB in terms of radiological outcome, in terms of the Oxford knee scores, or in terms of the range of motion. Interestingly, the only positive finding that we had was that the proximal, uh, the posterior tib uh, the posterior femur cuts, the medial side posterior femur cuts were significantly larger in knees which had undergone a gap balancing flexion method. Now this was, uh, you know, an incidental thing that we even observed. This was one of the uh, cases wherein I found that, you know, there is bone seen here in spite of, so this was a gap balanced knee and there is intact cartilage. And this is presumably a balanced knee. Now, this was surprising. And when the preliminary results after 30 cases, there were 50 cases in all. After 30 cases, when we did the preliminary analysis, we decided to check as to what are we doing with the rotation. And what we did find in three patients, we performed CT scans for three patients. This was outside the purview of the study. The IRB did not approve this. 
we found that we were actually externally rotating the femoral components much more than what would be desirable, right? So gap balancing was giving us the balance, but then externally rotating the components. Hence, today I am back at measured resection, uh, primarily because uh, I don't still know. I'm not convinced with uh, gap balancing and I cannot afford a robot, right? So we need to balance the knee in sagittal, coronal, and the rotational planes. Uh, as has been reiterated so many times by so many speakers before me, the extension space is determined by the distal femur cut and the posti uh, pro proximal tibia cut. The distal femur changes the extension gap only, but the proximal tibia changes the flexion and extension both. Similarly, the flexion gap is determined by the posterior femur cut and the proximal tibia cut. Now here again, the posterior femur cut changes the flexion gap only, but the proximal tibia cut changes both the gaps. Right, so uh, this was something which uh, Dr. Gupta just was uh, speaking about. That is the sweet spot. We get a perfect flexion and extension gap, which is uh, again balanced, or we have all these scenarios in which we so commonly get stuck in when performing our TKS. So let us, uh, th this is of course, we are are dealing with the sagittal balance now. So the first scenario wherein the flexion is tight and the extension is tight. Now this means that we have kept the knee too tight, we have resected too little bone on the distal femur and the proximal tibia probably. And we sh again need to remember that the proximal tibia alone contributes to both these gaps. Hence, an easy solution is to recut the proximal tibia which will open up the gap and hence problem solved. Right. Second scenario, the flexion is correct. And by correct, I mean we can get in at least the minimum size poly that uh, the particular implant system is designed for. So the flexion is correct and the extension is tight. So in this case, we need to remember that the distal femur cut affects extension only, especially if we are doing a PS femur and we cut less of the distal femur. It is very easy to go ahead, do a plus two cut as uh, Gupta sir just spoke and then so plus two, even uh, some people say plus four femur cut does not change the patellofemoral tracking. I am yet to do a plus four cut, but plus two cut is definitely safe and can be uh, done. But the problem lies when the FFD is more than 30 degrees about which we have uh, just heard in detail. The third scenario is where the flexion is loose and the extension is tight. Now this happens, or rather this can happen in a fixed, flex deform, uh, fixed flexion deformity knee. So there is a mismatch of balance. We need to recheck as to how much distal femur cut has been resected. If it is not adequate, if it is not at least nine millimeters, we can definitely go ahead, do a, a plus two recut. Or the other thing that can be done is to upsize the femur. Now this can typically be done if we are using an anterior referencing system. Using a posterior referencing system, this becomes difficult because then we would have already committed to the cut. The fourth scenario, the unpleasant scenario, is we get a tight flexion, but the extension is correct. So we are, for example, getting it a nine uh, poly in extension, but the flexion is too tight. Now, this typically happens when we are trying to do a CR knee in which the PCL is not balanced. The polo test about which uh, Brigadier Agarwal sir spoke about in the morning. The way out of this is to either recess the PCL uh, from the femur or from the tibia, whichever way one chooses to do, and either you know straight away go ahead and do a flat CR or do an anterior stabilized implant, or resect the entire PCL and then convert and do a PSTKR. Not the ideal thing to do, but this is of course uh, something that is required at times. So that you see in, at 90 degrees flexion, that, that is on the picture on the right side demonstrates the flexion gap with the PCL intact. And once the PCL is resected, the flexion gap opens up. Now please remember, releasing the PCL opens up the extension gap also. The PCL controls the flexion more than the extension, but it does control both. The fifth scenario is where the flexion is loose, but the extension is correct. You got a nine millimeter poly in extension, but your flexion is too loose. Typically happens in fixed flexion deformities. Now, or it can, happen, uh, it can happen when you are doing a standard TKA and you have gone ahead and done extensive collateral releases on the medial and lateral side. Here again, one easy way out is to upsize your implant, which will close your posterior uh, gap and reduce the flexion gap. Or you can use a constraint. 
Now remember, these constraints are all VV constraints. They are virus valgus constraints. They probably give you some amount of stability, not ideal, but uh, one way out of this problem. The sixth problem is when you get a tight flexion and a loose extension. Now this scenario happens when you have a recarvitamine, uh, especially in rheumatoids. A mismatch of balance. So what we can do is we can again measure how much distal femur cut has been taken and then distalize a distal femur by adding augments onto our implants. Now there are certain implant systems which do allow addition of distal femur augments onto the primary component itself without putting in a stem. Uh, that is an extra advantage which helps close down the extension gap or resect more of the posterior femur. So resecting most, more posterior femur opens up your flexion gap and then put an undersized femoral component. Right? Of course, we need to be careful here again that we do not expose too much of the bone in the process. The next issue is when you have a flexion which is correct but an extension which is loose. This happens when in a CR knee you do excessive distal femoral resections raising the uh, joint line bit too much. So the easy way out is to resect the PCL and then convert to a PS. Biomechanically not ideal but yes can be done. And if you are using a PS knee in which of course the PCL is already resected, we need to put in augments and then distalize and close down the extension gap. And the final problem is your flexion is loose, extension is loose. This is rather the easiest uh, problem to deal with. We know that we have probably resected too much of the tibia which controls both these gaps or there is a collateral ligament insufficiency. In these cases, putting in a larger poly solves the problem most of the times or at times a constrained implants may be required especially if there is a collateral insufficiency as well. So that was the uh, sagittal balance. Now what about the coronal balance? Coronal balance uh, problems, of course, we see more frequently on the medial side because virus knees are far more common than valgus knees. So leaving a tight MCL without correction uh, with the fear that if we release the MCL, we might actually end up with laxity is not a right thing to do because it is now known that leaving the medial side too tight or the medial knee uncorrected can lead to increased poly wear and wear, uh, increased poly wear on the medial side along with aseptic loosening over a period of time. So the standard protocol as has again been covered so many times and demonstrated beautifully today by Dr. Preetam in the surgery also is to do a deep MCL release right at the beginning, uh, remove all the osteophytes on the femur and on the tibia. The next step would be to release the posterior oblique ligament at the back which helps us get a full extension. So this corrects most of the problems. Now. The step ahead for medial releases, of course everybody has a different philosophy. What I follow is, I first try to uh, resect uh, extra bone and undersize the tibial component which gives me more space on the medial side. The second step which I would do is uh, MCL pie crusting and I I've done three or four maybe, uh, the sliding osteotomy on the medial side. So th that's the last thing that I would do. Now it is now known that MCL releases are not all the same. If there is flexion tightness on the medial side, it is the anterior part of the MCL which needs to be released. If it is the posterior uh, tightness which is felt more on extension, it is the posterior MCL which needs to be pie crusted. So this needs to be remembered. MCL pie crusting is not one generic term. So medial epicondylar osteotomy seems like a panacea. You know, you just uh, resect the bone and you correct all deformities. But the problem as demonstrated by Leo Whiteside almost 10 years back now is if you do that, if you do a medial epicondylar sliding osteotomy, you change the isometricity of the MCL in such a manner that you actually end up having instability at 60 and 90 degrees of flexion and therefore will require a constrained implant. So if you plan to do a epicondylar osteotomy, please keep a constrained implant. So as if this medial releases sequence and you know the philosophy was not uh, already complicated enough. Uh, last year, Raja Gopalan sir from Medanta published his own study wherein he now talks of lateral releases for correcting medial side tightness. I have no experience with this, but this is probably what we'll look about it in future. A valgus knee, we've already heard about it a lot. I will just add that pie crusting is safer and the better thing to do than doing extensive releases on the lateral side. Patlofemoral, uh, the last uh, component which needs to be balanced for a TKA. In a valgus knee, be very careful uh, because of the hypoplasia of the femoral condyle. Placing the femoral component in internal rotation will lead to patellar maltracking as well as keeping the joint line too distal because that will lead to a patella alta. 
However, what should also be remembered is we need to prevent overstuffing the PFJ, especially if you're one who likes to uh, you know, replace your patella. So you see in this case, this lady has a, a patella resurfaced with almost no resection performed. She's extremely painful 60 to 90 degrees just because her patella was not balanced properly. So both are important. We don't need to leave it too loose and we don't need to make it too tight. So the take home would be balancing is one very important pillar of uh, successful total knee arthroplasty. Never keep it loose, loose and uh, too loose, never keep it too tight. There is really no difference between MR and GB. It, it's like a religion, like I said, follow whatever you want to, don't disturb the other person. Uh, probably robotics will make life easier. We don't know, let's see. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anshu. Uh, as you said, there are possibilities of augments use because in all scenario, if you have already committed your cuts, you have already done. Yes. So I think if you have not planned, hmm. normally we do not keep augment in a primary anywhere. Just, just, just finish yes. because I know for the primaries, those, those who are doing a complex primary, they are definitely ready for augments. Yes. Yes. I think the better precaution is not to commit the cut unless you are balanced without cutting it. So do a primary soft tissue balancing and then you commit to your cut. That is the safest problem. Even let's say whatever cases you are dealing with, whether recurvatum or flexion deformity, there are um, fixed algorithm. Do cut femur less or distal femur cut or posterior femur, whether to down downsize. These philosophy has to understand properly before committing to any kind of a complex deformity, rather a standard deformity. So milder deformities, even I think complex deformities, whatever literature says, let's say MCL uh, transportation, pie crusting. In my 19, 20 years of career, I have never done a single case with any pie crusting, any osteotomies, everything is well balanced. If you know the art of a medial release, that is very nicely done and that medial release can be go up to, as I have already shown, the classical spiral release. And even uh, I would say that debulking of a medial tibial condyle, not vertical, I would say oblique slanting, that also gives an extra leverage on the medial soft tissue balancing. But anyway, co I congratulate you for a nice presentation of all balancing parts. Thank you. So if I uh, add to that, so of course, uh, recurvatum knees and high degrees of FFD are complicated primary scenarios. One would uh, rather keep, you know, even stem wedge everything ready. Uh, as regards doing a soft tissue release versus bony surgery, uh, somebody spoke of Johan Bellemans today. I think uh, uh, Sinu Sir was mm -hmm. talking about Johan Bellemans. I think TK Sir today is uh, going towards the philosophy which uh, Bellemans is trying to push. TK in my hands, how I have learned it and how I practice is primarily a bony surgery is not a soft tissue surgery. So I would, uh, you know, not try to do a soft tissue release almost every single time and try to correct everything in the bone. That of course is an individual philosophy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shekhar. I would like to now invite uh, Dr. Sunit Raj Shekhar yes. for his presentation. the last presentation it's one of the oldest debates soft tissue or uh, bony correction and I think still there are people who say kinematic alignment you cut the bones and you have an array of uh, spacers you have valgus varus spacers you have deep dishes so you can either go bony first or soft tissue first it is like a never-ending debate. Okay, so uh, mine is a very straightforward case. It's an ankylosed hip. Okay, so it's a 55-year-old male. He had problems of uh, hip pain in the right side since 12, 13 years, and he's not, not very sure about the other side. But uh, since seven, eight years, when he tried to squat, he had pain in both the hips. Uh, 
Um, very interestingly, he never really had a problem with the function because he could walk and at his shop he had a gadda. He says about a one feet uh, horizontal gadda where he used to just lie down and do his calculations, his um, uh, most of the work of the office. So he never had a problem because I was trying to elicit why he uh, had this and tamed this problem for 12 years and seek no advice. So he was mostly taking some Ayurvedic and homeopathic treatment. The last when I saw his uh, details, he was under the treatment of rheumatoids, was taking oral tofacinib for about eight months. He was uh, diabetic, almost controlled. And uh, he approached us only when he could not get down on his gadda or get up from his gadda without any help. That is when he thought he should take some kind of treatment. Uh, this is his condition. Uh, MRI was also available. He had bilateral avian with the right side severely ankylosed, uh, bony as well as uh, there was no jog of movement on the right side. So how we approached is uh, obviously stopping the biologicals, stopping methotrexate and uh, tofacinib also for three weeks. We tried to up the diabetic management, get the glycemic control. Uh, what we thought of the problems would be a medial blowout or um, uh, if you see the, if you see this x-ray, there is some amount of uh, proximal widening and splaying of the femur, which is because of some stress fracture that happened about two to three years back. He had some kind of um, uh, bed, bed rest for uh, two, three weeks, and then he was up and again walking. So that was uh, nothing but a stress fracture which healed well. We can see uh, nicely thickened cortex. So this was the treatment which was offered. One of the things we try to uh, be very sure of is the cup placement. In our ankylosed hip, I think we all agree here, the only thing we have to see is the cup placement. And if that is right, it is just like any primary, and you can get away with all primary implants here. So uncemented shell with 360 degree coverage, a capsular release both from the astabulum as well as femur 360, uh, 3D balancing with all the releases done without any uh, uh, reduction of the soft tissues. Without the gluteus max, we, are a, uh, we could attain the full stability. Then for the femur, it was a straightforward um, neutral uh, version and neutral rotation, conical fit Wagner. The fracture site was bypassed by two cortical lengths. So the post-op was very interesting in this case because uh, I could not get a very uh, acceptable gait. He still walked with a lurch. He still had difficulty standing straight and walking straight. What we realized was the soft tissue was severely compromised. It was uh, uh, grade three at the hip, the power. Pelvic lifts were possible. SLRs were uh, assisted till almost two months. And finally, at the last follow-up, which is like one 15 days back, he could have uh, independent walking. He was sitting on the washroom commode. Uh, he could also do some kind of uh, half squats and uh, now we are kind of happy with his gait. So what was important was the stability and the version and uh, the spine and hip require more uh, rehab. As we see, the spine is still scoliotic and the other side has an avian which he's not bothered about. So I think before the THR of the other side, we need to get the soft tissue balancing right and the soft tissue power. Thank you, that's the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Sunit. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Rohit Kanoi, sir, for his presentation now.
good afternoon respected seniors and dear colleagues uh, first of all i would like to thanks uh, dr kimka sir and shinarana team and meril for giving me such a wonderful opportunity uh, after such a great uh, academic feast i will discuss i will be discussing two topics that is uh, some tips and tricks to get a good range of motion in tkr patient and secondly the advantage of titanium niobium nitride coated implant which we have used today dr pritham has used so uh, what is a good range of motion uh, after uh, doing a good surgery we all our goal is to get a knee flexion of about 125 degree and above at this range most people can carry out almost all normal activities like walking at 70 degree uh, stairs climbing at about 85 to 90 degree and uh, even riding bike at 115 degree and apart from that full extension is also must uh, post operative range of motion depend on many factors and some of which are beyond our control like pre operative range of motion which decreases with obesity previous surgery presence of disability and deformity there are sometimes associated comorbidities uh, multiple joint involvement and motivational status these are the factors uh, even we do best surgeries we will not get the goal of uh, goal win, which uh, one of 125 degree or more but the patient satisfaction is good in these patients so it is not always that we have uh, we should have a good uh, full range of movement we can do some pre surgical preparation also like exercises if possible apart from the severe pain exercises done before knee replacement surgery can strengthen the knee improve flexibility and help to recover faster post operatively our uh, 10 out of 9 out of 10 knees which we do are simple and straight forward knees and our intro should be in precise in our steps uh, we have a routine we should have a routine fixed format uh, which we should consistently follow and deviate deviate only if very essential in our pre surgical preparation we can add tranexamic acid during induction to reduce bleeding as avoiding hematoma is very important to get a better range in early post op period surgical steps i'll be dis i'll be discussing under following headings which most have uh, been discussed already but to summarize first is alignment and bone cut both femur and tibia sizing of the components soft tissue balancing patello femoral tracking influence of implant design and lastly wound closer the first is alignment and bone cuts lot have been already talked retaining uh, restoring the axis distal femur cut should be 6 degree valgus in almost all simple cases distal femur precision is must and tibial resection with posterior slope femur uh, component should always be uh, with 3 degree of external rotation and never internal rotate the component or else there will be always uh, problem with the tracking distal femur cut dictates not only the extension gap but also how much extension patient is going to get post operatively as full extension is more important for routine walking rather than full flexion we may also need posterior capsular clearance as discussed earlier by dr ankur gupta and if still ffd we may have to take extra distal femur bones already discussed smoothness of the cut is very very important help the implant to fit snugly make sure that the cut is done snugly to alleviate the range of motion problem tbl cut resect 2 mm from the affected side and posterior slope of 5 to 7 degrees studies have shown that additional posterior slope did not affect the intraoperative flexion angle coming to the sizing of the component many a times we end up coming in between sizes like size c and d between whenever there are in between sizing the lower one has to be considered in anterior refreshing system because there is no problem of notching there and so we go for the smaller one 
still be beware of the flexion instability, which is not much problem than the oversizing to get a dif difficulty in range of motion. How does the design influence the range of motion? There are a lot of designs have came in last decades. Posterior condylar geometry, high flex design, posteriorly sloped TBL polytray. But still, a st st uh, lot of studies have shown that high flex versus conventional knees, no significant difference in the range of motion has been seen. It is a, mostly a matter of personal choice. Then gap and soft tissue balancing. Already discussed, final test during the trial should be a polo test, which we should always be doing on table. In, uh, pull the TBL component in extension for extension gap, and it should not come out easily. And check for the lift up of the TBL component in flexion, for flexion gap. Because at whatever degree of the flexion the TBL component is lifting off, that is the final de degree of flexion the patient is going to have post-operatively, whatever rehab you do. Next, patellofemoral tracking. The tracking should occur without any pressure, and there should not be any lift off of the TBL component in extreme flexion. The amount of flexion, again, that the patient is going to get in the gravity without lifting of the TBL component and without any mal tracking is the final amount of the flexion he is going to get. Finally, the wound closure is also very important. Better close in flexion and also apply adhesive dressing in flexion. This may help in faster functional recovery and getting easier range of motion early. Lastly, the analgesia part. The first day of a post-op patient or in a TKR patient, make sure that the patient has a smiling face. So I always use epidural analgesia for post-op pain relief for two to three days. And we can use local analgesia intraoperatively uh, or periarticular injections during TKR surgeries to get a good and improved range of motion without pain. Lastly, post-op rehabilitation is always very, very necessary and is a necessary part of our results. After good thromboprophylaxis, quadricep exercises, we can start early range of motion to the limit of pain. We can add CPM also in some cases. Drain out in 24 to 48 hours. Mobilize full weight bearing from day one or second day. Discharge patient in five to seven days. Suture removal in 12 to 14 days. And continuous rehab for six weeks, these patient needs until they get fully mobile and good range of motion and pain free. Next, coming to my next topic, that is titanium niobium nitride implant. Popularly known, known as gold knee because of its light golden color. Firstly, why we need this titanium niobium nitride? Some patients have allergy to the metal, especially nickel. May cause swelling in the joint or dry area in the lateral aspect of the wound. They get really benefited by this implant. Secondly, we are getting younger and younger patients for surgeries. And so, joint should last longer without implant loosening. So the use of artificial joint is always related to certain amount of wear. And its biological effect, example, the osteolysis potential are a function of bulk material as well as debris. And there are comprehensive studies with polyethylene wear. Material science is tracking two ways to minimize this risk of particle-induced aseptic loosening. First is reduction in polyethylene debris by low, uh, by low wearing articulation partners and Second is replacement, replacement of polyethylene by other materials. Different materials have came in last decades, coating by titanium nitride, diamond-like carbon, coating by titanium niobium nitride, modification of bulk metal, example, oxidized zirconium, cushion bearing, polyurethane, and or, or hydrogel. Just a short for in technique of preparation of these implant. It is uh, prepared by physical vapor deposition, PVD technique, which is a highly technical procedure. 
still not available in India and used, uh, used for coating the implant in high, high vacuum chamber to which nitrogen is added. This coating is securely anchored in the several atomic layers in the implant surface. And so there is no uh, chance of coming out of the coated, coatings. Titanium neogam nitride give a hard, smooth, low friction, wettable surface which when combined always for gaining fluid film lubrication. Titanium neogam nitride is twice as harder as zirconia knee and eight times harder than the conventional cobalt chromium knee. Its surface prevent the direct contact of the base material and surrounding tissue, which reduces the release of iron and particles due to wear. Thus protects the allergy and wear tear both. Summarizing the advantage of titanium neobium nitride implant, it is an outstanding, it is having an outstanding biocompatibility, allergy preventive, hardness superior to cobalt chromium based alloy, highly wettability with synovial fluids, low friction articulation, long term chemical stability, avoid inflammation and endoprosthetic loosening and extreme adhesive strength. Thank you. Thank you, Rohit sir. Okay, next I'd like to invite Dr. Rahul Ranjan uh, for his presentation. The management of neglected hip dislocation uh, with total hip arthroplasty. So, introduction in developing countries, uh, patient usually attend hospital many years, many days after trauma, having often received uh, alternative therapies before. Neglected hip dislocations become difficult to manage with time as acetabulum becomes filled with fibrous tissue, making reduction impossible by closed method. So, we are I am presenting the case series. One 66-year-old male married uh, farmer by occupation presented to our outpatient department in wheelchair with chief complaints of pain over the left hip region for one year, inability to wear weight for one year. Patient has history of injury over left hip, uh, uh, left hip uh, hit by uh, an ox one year back, uh, which was uh, neglected the time of injury and had taken Ayurvedic treatment. Uh, he is not able to wear weight on the affected limb and walk uh, and used to crawl on his daily activity. On examination, left lower limb sorting by 10 centimeter. Attitude was flexion, reduction, and internal rotation at the hip. Distonia vascular sensation intact. Active to movement present. DP and, uh, and distal pulses were present. And range of movement was grossly restricted. So this is the X-ray and uh, MRI of this patient. This is the CT scan. And uh, for this patient, we used uh, uh, mace. Uh, this is mace, which is uh, generally used by neurosurgeon in uh, cranioplasty. This mace uh, is made up of titan. Uh, we used this mace uh, thickness of 1.5 mm. And we used bone graft with. Uh, and uh, this is the walking. video after uh, four to five months of follow-up. Next case, 24-year-old male unmarried a student presented to our outpatient department with chief complaints of pain over left hip three and a half month, restriction of movement over left hip for three and a half month, alleged history of RTA three and a half month back since patient is limbs while walking and unable to wear weight on affected limb. 
uh, on examination, flexion, external rotation and abduction, distal lenovascular sensation intact, and uh, distal pulses were intact. Range of movement at uh, hip grossly restricted in all movement. This is uh, anterior hip dislocation of the patient. This is the amazing. So, we, uh, total hip replacement was done for this patient, and this is the follow up case. Uh, 24 year next case is uh, 24 year old male and married a student presented to our outpatient department with chief complaints of unable to walk two year alleged history of uh, RTA two years back uh, which uh, pain uh, with uh, pain subsided with the time but patient limped uh, while walking patient is unable to bear weight on the affected limb history of tibia kneeling one year back uh, on uh, examination uh, lower limb shortening by five uh, of five centimeter attitude flexion internal rotation and adduction of hip joint Equinus deformity at ankle, distal pulses and uh, neurovascular uh, is intact. Telescopy test uh, positive, vascular sign of Narath positive. This is uh, the X ray. And this is the images. So we uh, um, we used cancellous screw uh, to fix the bone graft, and total hip replacement was done for this patient. post operatively hip uh, range of movement was satisfactory and patient was able to walk without limping with equal length of the uh, equal length of bilateral lower limb this is uh, next uh, fourth case is the 30 year old male and married truck driver presented to our outpatient department with chief, chief complaint of pain for 9 month unable to walk 9 month alleged history of self fall uh, from truck 9 month back which was managed conser conservatively patient is unable to stand and wear weight on affected limb patient was on medication for hypertension uh, on examination uh, shortening of 2 cm attitude uh, flexion internal rotation and adduction of uh, at hip joint distal neurovascular sensation intact uh, pulses were intact and the range of movement restricted at hip joint telescopy test was positive and vascular sign of nerve was positive this is the x ray This is a CT scan. In this also, we used bone graft. That bone graft was fixed, uh, fixed with uh, 3.5 mm cancellous screw. And uh, total hip replacement was done for this patient. This is images. And this is the follow-up uh, after four months and five months. Thank you. Sorry, what's the name of Rahul, uh, excellent series, but I have noted one specific point on your history. You constantly check whether the patient is married or unmarried. What is the significance of ma being married and unmarried in every cases? And clinically mentioning, worth mentioning. <laughs> this was history. <laughs> there has to have some significance, I suppose. No? <laughs> Then why we are mentioning married and unmarried in every <laughs> cases? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Sunil, for waking up a drowsy play. <laughs> <laughs> I now invite Dr. Ankit Garg for his presentation. I'll be speaking on the last topic for management of TBL bone defect in primary total uh, knee replacement. So when we speak about the bone defects, there has to be a classification. Earlier, the classification was basically based on whether it is a content defect or a peripheral defect, depending on the intactness of the cortical rim. Then the classification progressed with an insole Barger cross based on how we treat the defect and based on the type of defect. Now, universally, Anderson Orthopedic Research Institute ARI classification is the universal accepted uh, uh, 
classification because it uses the same terminology both for femoral and tibial defect and it has eliminated all the terms like central, peripheral, cortical, contained, uncontained and has got minimal ambiguity. So for this we need to have a standing AP and a true lateral view and uh, in order to go for the joint line for femur we need to look for the femur epicondyles, posterior femoral condyles and location of patella. For tibia we need to have the tibial tubercle and fibula. It's basically classified into three types, type 1 with minimal bone loss and intact metaphyseal bone, type 2 where a damaged metaphyseal bone is there, it, depending on the involvement of the one or more condyle it can be further divided into 2A and 2B. Type 3 defects, they have a deficient metaphyseal segment and the bone loss on a major portion of the condyle and uh, it's a basically a summary, I won't be going into much of the details for the classification. When we deal with the primary valgus knee with a defect, most of the valgus knee mostly have a contained defect in the tibia. This may be uh, associated hypoplastic lateral femoral condyle, but the uh, segmental or cortical loss is a bit unusual. But when we look for the primary varus knee with defects, the bone loss is very much severe. There is always a peripheral bone defect and the deformity is severe. So what are the options for us to manage this bone defects? There are some special techniques which we can get away. We have cementing, we have bone grafting, we have metal augmentation and then custom made or condyler replacement processes but mo those are mostly reserved for a re revision scenario rather than a primary case. So for special technique we have a tibial tray offsetting where we can downsize the tibia and lateralize the tibial base plate. But it works way when the defect is usually very small around 2 to 3 mm and uh, it won't work in every case. Then we have a resection of additional defect. After taking a standard 8 mm resection of the tibia, we have to see whether how much the size of the defect is there. If it is uh, less than 6 mm, probably we can go with a poly size of 10 and 12 by additionally resecting the defect. Cementing as a way to manage bone defect, we have to understand that cement is an interface mechanical binder and the use of cement to manage the bone defect is highly questionable because of the difference of compression and shearing forces. Usually when there is a central defect or a minimal defect with an adequate bone stock, it gives a quite a good stability to the base plate. But when we look at the large defect or peripheral defect like this, then the interface has to be sloped. There will be a constant shearing force which will be occurring at the interface and it will lead to failure of our uh, uh, replacement. So it has to be avoided because we cannot pressurize the cement properly in the small, this peripheral defect. There will be always a radio lucent line which will be present. What with the cement with screws, it can be used for defect when the stability of base plate is concerned. It is definitely cement with screw is a better option rather than using a cement alone and it can offload the shearing forces to some extent only. It is definitely a getaway option when we sometimes face any difficulty and we are not planned. Bone grafts, it has uh, definitely it's a cost effective, it is a preservation of bone stock, low transfer will be more physiological, but there are certain disadvantage, although less like non-union, collapse, fragmentation, infection. So bone grafting can be done and it can be fixed to the defect either using a screw or using a mesh. On there are structural bone allograft also which can be used for a successful uh, biological material to defect, uh, restore the hemicondyla segmental defect. For bone grafting in contained defect is not an issue. We usually put the bone graft, uh, make the plane uh, parallel means uh, completely smooth and then we can go ahead. But when we look for the slope defect, there are various techniques described. One technique is described by Windsor, it's Insol and Sculo where uh, we resect the uh, uh, defect and then we take use of the uh, distal tibial cut or a proximal tibial cut, chamfer cut and use the grafts from there and then we implant it with the help of screws. So what we are doing, we are just uh, putting it on and our advantage. Another technique has been described by Lam, Chan et al, where they convert the defect to modify the forces to our advantage. What they do? In case of such defects, they cut it and dissect it to make it like a terrace and then they put the bone grafts, put the screw and then they put the base plate. 
what they have explained in their original paper that it will provide a better, uh, less shearing force to the tibial base plate and will be more stable in the fixation. Although, also we have uh, allografts also which we can use to uh, put up the massic defects, but definitely the availability of allografts always becomes an issue due to bone bank and uh, they have a good uh, outcome. One good paper was published by Yashwant uh, Singh Tanwar et al. And uh, they have put that after standard dissection, they used to fix the triangular mesh with screws to contain the defect. And then they used to fill it with morselized bone grafts from the cuts. And uh, they have a good, shown good results. These are case example taken from the original paper where they had a severe bone defect and what they did, they used a screws mesh and then they put the bone grafts inside it and they have a follow-up which they have, uh, they have a very good excellent follow-up. However, there are issues like galvanization, corrosion between the two metals between the mesh and the tibial best plate which has not been addressed in the paper. Then we have a reconstruction using a bone graft but we have to always use a stem extender to offload the base plate to a good extent and thereby reducing the base plate deflect, uh, deflection in uh, by giving a proper distal fixation. Metal augments definitely are more stable than bone grafting or using a cement screw combination, but uh, it uh, provides an immediate way, a biomechanical and impl implant stability, but definitely the cost is an issue and further bone section is an issue because nowadays we are getting a early age for replacement and we have to conserve the bone stock in case we go for a revision scenario. These are femoral augments which we are not dealing here. For tibia, we always use block, wedges, hemi, total, offset adapters, extenders. This is one example where cones have been used for uh, the replacement. The follow-up when we see for this bone grafting, we find that there are various papers in the recent literature and they have explained that even after seven years, the failure of bone grafting is reported some as 3% in some study. To uh, Ahmed et al, they reported 10, uh, 10 years follow-up, they didn't had any failure. And basically, this is the biomechanism of the whole thing which I am talking about. The cement provides the least stability. The cement screws provides a better. Plexiglass is same as the bone graft. And then the metal wedge, which provides the, probably the best stability when we look for the peripheral bone defects. So we have some case examples where uh, this is the example where resection was done and metal augment was used. There are some case example where severe bone peripheral bone defects which we can see in the lateral x-ray uh, and we used a distal offset extender and we used to reconstruct the defect with uh, technique described by Winsall, uh, Winsall and Insall et al. And there is another example where uh, we have reconstructed the defect third example where a large defect was there. This is the pre-op walking video. So what we did was uh, we reconstructed it uh, with the screw and uh, then we balanced it and finally we got a good outcome. This is a patient at six weeks follow-up. I'm afraid the video is uh, not working properly. So what is that? Implants at right angle to the mechanical axis recreates a normal biomechanics. An implant should be on stable platform for a good function and a long-term survival. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ankit. I would invite uh, Dr. Abhishek Tripathi uh, for his talk.
Uh, good afternoon to all respected seniors. Uh, my uh, topic is management of bone defects in tick care. Uh, the bone defect tick care is a frequent problem with controversial management. Most moderate and severely deformed and the most revisionees have significant bone defects. Uh, causes of bone defects are arthritic deformities, hypoplasia, avian, trauma, and previous surgeries. Uh, depending upon the size, location, and margins, it may be central, peripheral, contained, or uncontained. And this is a RAND classification. Type 1 is focal metaphyseal defect. Type 2 is extensive metaphyseal defect with intact cortical rim. And type 3 is combined metaphyseal and cortical defects. This is a diagram showing uh, contained and uh, non-contained defects. There is cortical rim present in the contained and uh, non-contained defect. Cortical, cortical ring is not present. This is another classification of femoral tibia defects. Now, etiology of bone deficiency in primary tear care. In various knee, defect usually lies on the posteromedial aspect of tibial plate 2. And in valgus knee, bone loss is usually located centrally or lateral tibial plate 2. And the patient with the previous STO, bone defect lies on the posterior lateral corner of the tibia. In uh, uh, patient with a revision TKR, uh, in patient with a uh, unicondylar knee, the localized defect found in the femur and tibia. In the postcondylar implant, distal and posterior part of femur and central and peripheral and tibia defect is found. And the hinge processes, diffuse cavitatory type of defect is found. Now the goals of the uh, management is preparation of the host bone, restoration of the anatomical joint line, axial alignment, ligamentous stability, gap balance, and secured implant fixation. Now, the options to deal with the bone defect, which I think already discussed, uh, first is the increased bone resection. Uh, be aware of always trying to resect the defect. Uh, numerous studies show reduction in the strength with the more uh, distal resection because it lessens the osseous support and a small tibia, a smaller tibia component decreases surface area which increase unit loading to tibia component, which results in loosening. Tips of making bone cuts. Assess bony defect prior to making the bone cuts. Measure the defect after the bone cuts. Take great care in removing components or making bone cuts, especially in the metaphyseal bone. Strength of bone diminished by 33%, two centimeters below the TL plate 2. And the, always keep TBL cut above the head of fibula. Now, translation of component. Uh, shifting tibial component medial or lateral away from the defect to eliminate the reduce the side of the defect is called translation of component. It is utilized when the peripheral defect um, uh, involves less than 50% of the single condyle. Uh, it uh, requires the use of smaller TBA component for coverage and may alter the force uh, transmission across the implant and it may cause lo uh, loosening of the implant. If shifts, uh, shifts more medially, it creates a relative lateralization of the tibial tubercle, which may cause patero-femoral insufficiency. This is a diagram showing translation of component, the tibial component. Uh, filling of cement, use of cement is usually indicated for the small defect, because it, uh, it is a poor choice for processes, because it can't be pressurized, a lamination formed within the cement, and nest shrinkage of 2% on polymerization is found. The end result may be cantilever bending, fatigue of the tail processes requiring revision. Uh, now the cementing with uh, reinforcement with screw or mesh, no significant improvement seen with this. Uh, bone grafting is indicated if the defect is more than 50% of the condylar area. Auto grafts or allo grafts may be used. Uh, advantages are avoid the use of custom implants avoid possibility of the cement fragmentation, preserve subchondral bone, provide a uniform cement thickness, bone stock restor restoration for further vision, it is cost effective, and more physiological load transfer occurs if union happen. Disadvantages are limited in amount, malunion, non-union, late collapse, or risk of disease transmission. This is the bone grafting technique which I already discussed with my previous lecture. This is a structure allograft used in proximal tibia deficiency. Uh, reasons of failure of bone grafts are the limb malalignment without overload, trying to gra fit graft in a sclerotic bone, poor graft fit, or non-incorporation uh, of the graft. 
custom implant are valuable in complex deficiencies for the peripheral defect more than 1.5 cm in depth, provide excellent force transmission between the implant and bone, and provide precise fit for the defect. Now, the metal which augmentation provide adequate loading and load transfer, indicated in peripheral or central defect within an area of more than 10% of condyle and depth of the 5 or 215 mm. No donor site morbidity is present and customization is possible. This is the metal uh, wedge and uh, square of wedge argument. Uh, the extended intermodal stems relieve the stress in deficient bone in metaphysical area and controversy exists in cementation of the X stem. Now, I want to show some, uh, some of the, my cases. This is first case, 45-year female operated elsewhere one year back for the proximal tear fracture, uh, restrictive flexion up to 30 degree. This is the flex, flex, uh, flexion on OT table. Uh, there is uh, no uh, malunion at the medial condyle. This is a post-operative X-ray. This is a uh, second day, uh, second day post-operative flexion around 90 degree. And uh, this is one month follow-up. Now case two is 65 year fem uh, female, bedridden from six years, failed TKR on the other limbs 10 years back. There is severe valgus deformity This is managed with the bone graft only. Unfortunately, tibial stem is not present with me. This is the second post-op day, a picture. Uh, now, I, wa I want to share, uh, share you another case of, of me. This is not ideal case to show uh, for this platform, uh, but I want to show you because of the only clinical result. This is 50 year, uh, 50 year female, history of tuberculosis knee two year back, ATT course completed two year back. This is the uh, X-ray, severely deformed knee. Uh, this is the post-op uh, X-ray. And this, uh, the extension of femur is, uh, lies on the anterior cortex of the femur. But uh, fortunately, till now, till after four months, there is no anterior thigh pain or patient. This is the video of patient after three months. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abhishek. Is there any questions? Okay, so presentation mementos, did it? Yes, sir. I would like to invite uh, Dr. Khemka, sir, to please present the mementos to all speakers. Uh, Dr. D. Sunil, please. Dr. Ankur Gupta, sir. Dr. Anshu Shekhar. Dr. Sunit Raj Shekhar. <laughs> Dr. 
डॉक्टर रोहित कनोई डॉक्टर राहुल रंजन डॉक्टर अंकित गर्ग डॉक्टर अभिषेक त्रिपाठी Now I would request Dr. Kemka sir to please say a few word, words of thanks for our faculty and our guests. We are very much thankful to all the faculties. Dr. Sinu Kumar Bhaskaran, Dr. Anand Gupta, Dr. Neera Jatkar sir, Dr. H S Agrawal sir, Dr. Alok Agrawal sir, and Dr. Sakle Saab and all the guest speakers of outside in Chhattisgarh. Your presence and participation make this conference successful. Thank you to all of you. Uh, all the delegates, please, your certificates are available on the counter outside. Hello. And we are very thankful to Meryl and Max group for participating and conducting this workshop and live surgery from uh, Sri Narayana Hospital as well as from Pune by Dr. Neera Jatkar. Thank you very much, Meryl group. And three cheers for Sri Narayana Hospital and Dr. Kemka. Hip hip! Hip hip! Hip hip! I would like uh, to thank Dr. Alok Agrawal sir for all his support in all academic activities.